Soft Boy awakens his power to obliterate the god of dragons. In this world, dragons are magical and powerful creatures of ancient lineage, true predators, and natural enemies of humans. Because of this, there are dragon hunters who make a living by accepting missions to kill these creatures and protect the cities. There are two ways to do this. The first is by freezing the dragon's blood with silver, an aura that emanates from silver weapons. And the second way is simply letting the sunlight burn their bodies. The Anaim begins by showing Ragna, one of these dragon hunters, emanating silver from his own hand to freeze several dragons with just one touch. Despite having this immense power, he desired to be even more powerful, showing that he was never satisfied. However, all of this was just a vision of the boy who was in the middle of training, trying to face a dragon with little result, which was a terrible time to have visions. Realizing that Ragna was having difficulties, his partner Leonica steps between him and the creature, easily finishing off the dragon. Leo tells him that he needs to stay more focused during battles like she does, and Ragna thanks her for her help by patting the girl on the head. Next, they burn the dragon's body and freeze its heart with silver, completing the job. When they return to the city, we see that Leo is considered a prodigy for having killed dozens of dragons alone, being the best hunter in the city of Ranabera, responsible for killing most of the creatures there despite being only 12 years old. Everyone invite and admire the girl, giving her various nicknames, but for Ragna, her only loyal partner, she is a hero who be sure will become even stronger as she grows up, and he takes several photos of his little heroine to document her growth. However, unlike Leo, Ragna had no ability to hunt dragons, which led some people to mock their partnership, like Sykes Charluk, ranked as the second best dragon hunter, with the highest number of creature kills in the city after Leo, which disappoints him because the girl didn't even know who he was. Sykes tells Ragna that he is only slowing down his partner, as his abilities are well below average, calling him nothing more than a burden. However, Leo immediately draws her sword, pointing it at Sykes to defend Ragna, leaving the hunter speechless. Leo asks him what he seeks with his silver sword and how much he desires to achieve what he wants, explaining that she seeks to have maximum strength to become stronger than anyone or anything. Because of this goal, she became a dragon hunter, as dragons are the most powerful creatures of all, and to prove that she is indeed the strongest, she wishes to face even the feared dragon god. She then asks all the people in the area if anyone wants to join her, promising to share everything they desire, such as wealth, status, and even glory. However, Everyone remains silent and only Ragna speaks up, swearing to follow her as long as he can. Although she just delivered a speech worthy of the number one dragon hunter, showing experience and determination when speaking with her partner, it becomes clear that she is still a 12-year-old girl. Even though she is a prodigy, there are still simple things that every child has, like wanting to sleep without taking a bath. At night, Ragna puts her to bed and lets her sleep peacefully while he goes to train, as his greatest desire is to become at least somewhat useful to Leo before he dies. He knows that, as he has no talent for hunting, he will never come close to her level, and he is certain that he will die at the hands of a dragon, but he wants to help her in some way before his departure. However, at that moment, he sees the figure of a man who tells him that he will never fulfill his wish of being useful to Leo, because he will lose her before that happens. Then Ragnar starts having visions of the city in flames being attacked by multiple dragons, and shortly after, he sees his worst nightmare, the girl being killed by one of the creatures. Seconds later, he wakes up, realizing that he had fallen asleep while training, but is still scared by the fact that he can still hear the voice of the strange man in his head, saying that her time was near. The next day, Ragna goes shopping to cook whatever Leo wants, fulfilling all her wishes, making the girl very happy. Later, after eating the meat she craved, she falls asleep and Ragna puts her to bed as he did the previous night. In the morning, the two go to the guild hall where dragon hunters accept their missions. However, they are surprised to find that there is not a single task available that day because the city has not had many dragon attacks recently. So Leo and Ragna go outside for some fresh air and Ragna notices that her hair has grown. He decides to take advantage of the free time to cut her hair, but while doing so, he remembers the nightmare he had about her. To make matters worse, that Maggie has the same horrible dream again and decides to spend the early hours of the morning training. However, even there, he cannot find peace as he continues to hear the voice of the strange man telling him that you will lose Leo soon. Later, at a bar in the city, the dragon hunters gather to discuss the strange fact that winged creatures have been disappearing from the city for a few days. One of them mentions that the dragons were migrating eastward towards a city called Donna Pieru, a place that has not been attacked by them in a decade. Leo overhears the conversation and once again, acts like a 12-year-old, Mentioning that the city Dona Piero reminds her of a famous confectionery shop called the Silver Hen, and suggests that if they go there on a mission to hunt dragons, they should take the opportunity to visit the shop and try its food. Meanwhile, 
Ragnar still cannot shake the dream from his mind, fearing the words of the strange man and wondering if he is a vision or a ghost, feeling that he is neither of those options. Liam notices his partner's concern and asks him why he has been working so hard lately. He replies that it is an attempt to help her in some way. Recognizing his concern for her, Leah recalls the day they first met, saying that when she saw him for the first time, she thought they had the same potential and the same level of strength. This surprises him because, apart from having no natural talent, he was still getting beaten up when they first met. However, although she admits that Ragna indeed has no natural ability to be a dragon hunter as she does, she says that her instincts tell her that he will become very strong somehow, that she cannot say when or why. Therefore, she promises to protect Ragna until that day comes. In a flashback, we learn about Ragma's past. His parents were eaten by dragons when he was only three years old, leaving him an orphan. Some relatives took him in, but shortly afterward, they too were killed by dragons, leaving Ragna with no one. That's when he was bought by a wealthy man, but some dragons burned down his property, leading him to believe that he was cursed. The rich man who bought him and his friends also blamed the boy's bad luck for what happened. They beat Ragna, accusing him of working for the dragons because wherever he went, dragons appeared shortly afterward, leaving only him as the survivor. Just when he had lost all hope of finding peace, he met Leo, who invited him to become a dragon hunter alongside her. She explained that having a special connection with these creatures was not a bad thing when you were hunting them, especially if you survived the fight. So she decided that he would be her partner that day, even though he was worried about bringing his bad luck to her and making Leo end up like all the others who had been close to him. However, she told him that only the weak died for her and the strongest, stronger than the dragon, survived. Since she was very strong, he had nothing to worry about. To prove his potential to Ragna, she took him on one of her hunts, and when they found a dragon, the boy thought it was the end for both of them. However, Leo defeated the dragon with a single blow, proving that she was indeed very strong. This made Ragna believe that it was safe to be near her because, unlike the others, he could not imagine a way for someone like her to die before him. From that day on, they became inseparable partners, with Ragna thinking that he was no longer cursed by being alongside a hero like Leo, wishing to stay by her side until he eventually died at the hands of a dragon. That's why the nightmare of losing her that he couldn't stop having was so terrifying, as she meant everything to him. The next day at the guild hall, all the dragon hunters gather when they learn that the city of Donapier has been attacked and destroyed by the dragons. Since they hadn't suffered any dragon attacks for a decade, they thought they didn't need hunters to protect them. There, Liu asks Sykes what happened, and he explains that he heard that a horde of dragons attacked the city of Dona Pieru, and that's why the kingdom issued an emergency mission for all hunters to go after these dragons. This makes Ragna panic because he knows that this means his vision is about to come true. But when he tries to warn Leo about the impending danger, they hear a noise, and when they leave the guild hall, they see the city in flames and the dragon horde attacking, making Ragna recognize the similarity of the scene to his dream. Desperate, he goes after her, while the dragons attack the people who try to resist the attack in vain. Then the men see a person emerging from the flames and go to check if they are injured. However, the blood-covered man kills them all with blades made of his own blood, revealing that he too is one of the dragons, a superior one. This terrifies everyone, including the hunter Sykes, who is the second best among them. Ragna also sees the creature in the distance and immediately realizes that those blades are exactly what will cause Leo's death. So when the dragon is about to attack Sykes, Ragna jumps in his direction, determined to do everything to save Leo's life. However, his sword breaks upon hitting the dragon, and the creature then sets everything on fire. Leo sees that Ragna is in danger and rushes to the location, worried. Luckily, the boy falls safely into the river. She then asks Skiles to leave the superior dragon with her and go to Ragna. Next, she goes to the creature, swearing to avenge it for hurting Ragna. Meanwhile, the boy continues sinking deeper into the river, reminiscing about his dream. After losing Leo, he sinks into his quest for revenge, aiming to hunt all the dragons to extinction, training to his utmost potential, becoming incredibly strong, even though he feels it's never enough. He also makes new partners, but they all die, leaving him as the lone survivor, leading a life full of losses despite his efforts, reaching a point where he achieves the impossible. Then Ragna manages to get out of the river, encountering the man from his vision again. He finally realizes that this is his future self, and that maybe deep down he only wanted a chance to die but somehow always managed to survive. The man reveals that he is the future Ragna who caused his visions and expresses disgust for his past self. Despite idolizing Leo as a heroine and professing his love for her, he didn't become the strongest being in the world to keep her safe. He gained the strength he needed only after losing her, but then even though he was strong enough to face any dragon and protect anyone, he had already lost everything with nothing left to save, unable to see any reason for all that power. 
Ragna asks him to transfer all this strength to him because it's the right moment to save Leo and the others in the city. His future self agrees, hitting Ragna with his sword, causing Ragna to scream in pain, startling Skiles, who is keeping him safe during his visions. At that moment, his past and future selves merge into one with Ragna receiving all their memories and powers, understanding everything that happened, and the pain of becoming strong only after losing Leo. However, both Ragnas knew that this union came at a price, and they were both willing to pay it. Meanwhile, Leo is already tired of fighting the superior dragon, and he recognizes her strength. She also asks if he is the famous god of their kind, which annoys the creature. He says he doesn't come close to the grandeur of their god, and that she shouldn't even compare the two. After a long time of battling, he finally introduces himself as Grinwelt, explaining that he is the tenth seat of the Blood of the Wing, the most humble among all the superior dragons. This surprises Leo as he has proven to be a formidable opponent. Grinwelt decides to have some fun and reveals why the city and the kingdom are marked for destruction. He tells her that their god has always loved the exotic dishes created by humans, especially the famous bakery in the city of Dona Piero. However, even though he was a loyal customer, the bakery was robbed and went bankrupt. With the shop's bankruptcy, which was the reason the Winged Blood Dragons didn't attack the city, their god became extremely sad and angry. As a result, he ordered all of his lineage to destroy the entire kingdom. Grimwell tells Leo all this to prove that the fate of the human nation was in the hands and whims of the god of the dragons. He insists that the battle between them and the hunters was never real because humans only survived when the dragons didn't take them seriously. He makes it clear that there was not a single human considered a threat to their species. After delivering the speech about how humans were completely insignificant compared to dragons, Grimwell prepares to end the fight in Leo's life. However, at that moment, he senses a strange presence behind him, becoming frightened and even considering it might be an illusion. What he felt was the new power that Ragna gained, making him incredibly strong and capable of freezing dragons with a simple touch of his hand, thanks to all the effort of his future self. Grimwell remembers the memories of the adult Ragna passing through his head. After losing Leo and spending ten long years hunting dragons for revenge, desiring their extinction, he slowly became a part of his sword. Even though the fusion was painful, he continued to fight relentlessly. After five years, he had completely merged with his silver sword, making his own body a powerful weapon, radiating silver. Three years later, he developed a technique to increase the silver in his body. After another four years, he learned to control it at will. After a total of ten years, he became a being far beyond human capacity, mastering his silver battle arts technique. All these years of training and techniques were now in the present Ragna. Approaching Grimwald, he senses a power similar to the one he felt around monarch dragons, those chosen by their god to lead dragon lineages. Despite feeling this supreme power from Ragna, Grimwald denies being afraid of a mere human and assumes his true form, enabling him to use his full potential. He starts another speech about how dragons are powerful and humans are weak and inferior. However, in a matter of seconds, Ragna freezes Grimwald completely and shatters him leaving nothing of the supreme and chatty dragon. With everything finished, Ragna finally comes to his senses, realizing he had saved Leo's life and changed his future of pain and suffering. He runs to her, barely believing what happened, and starts crying, relieved that he still has his partner by his side. As he cries as if the world were ending, she tries to reassure him, saying that everything will be okay and recognizing his hard work to become so strong. He says that someone else worked hard to achieve those results, someone who was no longer there despite Ragna knowing how much he suffered and missed Leo. Meanwhile, somewhere in the sky, filled with gears for some reason, the future Ragna meets a girl who tells him that even though he and his past self have accepted the price of their fusion, the past Ragna won't live for much longer. She notices that in all those years she knew Ragna, she had never seen him make such a sentimental expression as he was making at that moment. Even after all that time together, this was the first time she saw him without a summer look. However, what mattered now was that all their hopes of creating a world where no dragons existed were entirely in the hands of their past selves. On that day, the dragons attacked seven cities in the Eastern Kingdom, and out of the seven, six were completely destroyed, including the capital. However, on that same day, the Dragon Reaper was born. After that, in Ragnus City, the dragons mysteriously disappeared and they managed to put out the fire despite the numerous casualties and the destruction of half the city, including the inn where Ragna and Leo lived. So the two were left without a place to sleep and had to take shelter in the home of the hunter Skiles, with the boy still in shock that he had truly prevented his nightmare from happening. When Skiles enters the room where the two are, Ragna tells him that the best thing they can do is leave the city and head toward the nearby border because the dragon god demanded the kingdom's destruction and the creatures treat his demands as law so they won't give up on attacking the place. However, if they move away from their target, everyone could be safe. 
Skiles questions why Ragnus suddenly became intelligent and extremely strong as he had no talent before. He asks how Ragnar gained all that power to defeat Grimwelt so easily, but before he can answer, Ragna falls asleep on his bed. Leo explains that even though he spent many nights training hard while she slept to achieve those results, all that strength was draining him and making him unstable. At that moment, Ragna starts calling for Leo, and she tries to reassure him that she's right by his side, but he continues to call her name. Suddenly, she and Skiles hear a noise and go to see what it is, leaving Ragna sleeping. Outside, they are startled to see that, for some reason, the forest is attacking them. Leah rushes to the site of the attack, with the woman who was with Ragna from the future saying that their story is about to begin now that their paths will cross. A little earlier, we see that somewhere within the forest, a chef serves a roasted lamb dish to a portly man named Marugabud. Clearly, the chef and his staff were very afraid of him, and with good reason, as soon as he tastes the food, Marugabud exclaims that he found the meal delightful, but nothing compared to the taste of the chef. He reveals himself to be a very hungry dragon. He devours the chef, leaving his two staff members horrified, but they also don't last long. Next, he moves on to the last person standing and says that the dragon god demanded the destruction of all humans in that kingdom, which means he can devour as many people as he pleases. Then, his tentacles start to spread throughout the city like vines, which are the attack Leo and Skiles saw coming toward the forest. The dragon captures the poor girl and prepares to feast on her, just as he did with the others. Meanwhile, dragon hunters rush into the forest, trying to defeat the tentacles they encounter on their way. However, Skiles doesn't understand how a dragon is attacking because they are creatures that should not withstand sunlight. This makes him doubt if they can trust something as basic as this information. Nearby, Leo is attacking the relentless tentacles that keep emerging. Suddenly, she notices that many of them have just destroyed Skiles' house's roof and captured Ragna, who was still sleeping soundly. She rushes to save him, but the tentacles prepare to attack her. However, with Leo in danger, Ragna immediately awakens from his slumber, radiating silver from his body, freezing all the nearby tentacles, which catches the attention of the dragon and the hunters nearby. He then realizes what's happening and runs towards the dragon, completely ignoring Leo, who is calling for him, asking him to wait for her but ends up falling behind because she struggles to keep up with his pace. Ragna doesn't hear her calling his name because he feels guilty for feeling relieved after saving her and lowering his guard, realizing that he should have known the danger was far from over. He then spots the dragon and delivers a powerful kick to its face, sending it flying and releasing the girl. Ragna believes that the only way to change his future and prevent everyone around him from perishing at the hands of the dragons is to not rest until they are all exterminated by his own hands. However, he wonders if he is truly capable of such a task, considering that even his future self couldn't succeed. It's only at this moment that he recognizes the girl right next to him and realizes she is Crimson, his future partner. Ragna believes that Crimson must have come to find him, but her reaction indicates it was merely a coincidence. Nonetheless, he remains excited because now they can join forces in their mission to exterminate the dragons. However, the girl denies being Crimson and begins to introduce herself. Ragna interrupts her, claiming her name is Elisa Yorkshire, a 14-year-old girl from a farming village, where she worked for a man whose property was attacked by a dragon and she disappeared since then. Ragna insists that at least that was the story she told him in the future, but she corrects him, saying she doesn't understand and clarifies that her name is Elise. Ragna cuts her off again, stating that he knows she is the dragon monarch Crimson, a former Bloodwing progenitor, considered a traitor by her kind for attempting to kill their god. Ragna continues explaining that it was Crimson who also bridged the future and the present so they could achieve their goal of exterminating the dragons from the world, including himself. Ragna then explains that they share the same objective, and for that reason, they should work together, as this time they might succeed where their future versions failed. However, the girl slaps him in the face, offended because he first referred to her as a man and then as a dragon. This catches Ragna completely by surprise, and at this moment, Leo finally arrives in the forest, exhausted from running so much. However, she's not the only one who arrives, as the dragon has also returned and is very angry that a mere human kicked it in the face. He attacks Ragna, determined to tear him apart, but Ragna tosses a small ball into the dragon's mouth, causing it to explode as he carries Leo to a safe distance from the blast. Elise observes Ragna from a distance and Leo looks at how everything froze due to the explosion, recognizing that her partner has become strong, just as she always felt he would, saying she just didn't think it would happen so quickly, and now it will be challenging for her to catch up to his level. Ragna then asks Leo to take the city's residents to safety at the border while he stays behind to handle something. He mentions that he will meet her once he's finished, but Leo insists that they won't part ways and she will stay with him. Ragna explains that it will be dangerous for her, 
But Liu points out that there's always danger in the Dragon Hunter's line of work, and asks why he's trying to leave her behind. Ragnat attempts to explain that they will only be separated for a short time, but this leaves Leo irritated. The boy is surprised as he has never seen her lose her composure like this before, considering that she always appears strong, calm, and resolute with better judgment and confidence than many adults. However, in this situation, he realizes that she is still just a 12-year-old child. Ragnar recalls what his future self said about idolizing a young girl and taking advantage of her, making him understand what he meant as he was weak, forcing her to be stronger than necessary. So he decides that he doesn't want to be weak anymore as it's the only way he can achieve his goal and keep Leo safe. He reminds the girl of what she said when they first met, about how the weak die and the strong survive, and how that saved him, but now she is weak and won't survive if they continue together. These words hurt Leo, making her so angry that she tries to attack Ragna, but he stops her sword with just a finger and tosses her aside. He then bids her farewell and Leo loses consciousness. When she wakes up, she is already on her way to the border being carried by Skiles. The hunter asks what happened between them and Leo recalls when she told Ragna about her goal to become the strongest in the world. She had held that goal since the first time she wielded her sword, but when she asked if he had a similar dream, he said that as long as he was with her, everything was fine. This brings tears to Leo's eyes because he has now achieved the maximum strength she has always strived for, without understanding why he left her alone. From a distance, Ragna watches as she and the other town's residents depart, and Lise asks if he really wanted to separate from Leo in that way. Ragna cries, saying that he can only be near people if their loss won't hurt him or if they won't die. He goes on to call her crimson again, which irritates the girl. She says that if she were truly a dragon, she would have died as soon as the sunlight hit her. Ragna insists that the sun is not a problem because his silver art's powers are locked and even though she can't use her powers properly, her weaknesses have disappeared. She tells Ragna to fulfill his mission of destroying the dragons alone and asks him to stop referring to her as a man. However, he says that she can change her gender and age at will, despite her continued denial of everything he says. This makes Ragna wonder if he will ever gain her trust. He remembers that the future Crimson said the story would begin when their paths cross, even though it would take some time for her to trust him. So he tries to win the girl over by mentioning the things he knows and what he can do for her, explaining that he is well-versed in arithmetic and accounting, as well as reading and writing, since he studied to assist Leo. He also says he can cook delicious dishes and perform other household chores, and he can make her life easier by doing various tasks for her, promising to do all the activities for her, just like he did for Leo. However, Liz finds everything very strange and refuses to form a partnership with him. At this moment, Ragna collapses with a fever, and while he's unconscious, she decides to examine his body, inadvertently revealing her dragon eye. In the future, Ragna met Crimson after defeating a dragon. She appeared to him, admitting she was impressed that a human body had reached such a high level of power. He quickly struck her down, but Crimson reappeared, asking them to join forces as together they could exterminate the dragons. However, as he was a dragon himself, Ragna struck her down again. Crimson reappeared once more, but this time with a different age, insisting that they work together. In the present, Ragna finally awakens and Lise tells him that she helped him because she couldn't abandon the person who saved her. Ragna thinks he fainted because his body hadn't acclimated to the silver battle arts yet. Lise then asks if it's true that the dragon god ordered them to destroy the kingdom and Ragna confirms it, saying they need to start hunting all the dragons right away. He explains that they had already accomplished this more than 20 years in the future, but now that they met earlier, they could start the hunt sooner. However, she continues to pretend not to understand as no human knew her true form and she doesn't understand how he knows about the future, as something like this had never happened before. Still, she admits that it seems to be quite fun because while examining Ragnar's body while he was asleep, she discovered he is fused with a silver sword, which allows him to generate and emit it. She doesn't understand how it works, but it's evident that Ragnar's potential is incredibly high, which excites her and makes her want to test this new method of killing dragons. Suddenly, a dragon flies past them in the direction of the city where the people were. Immediately, Ragnar carries the girl and starts running towards the dragon, determined to save the people. He asks if she has any orders, making it clear he will obey whatever she commands, which excites her. She denies being crimson once again, but orders him to destroy all the dragons. Then, after reaching the location where all the dragons were flying, Ragna prepares to face them, creating several silver swords that defeat the dragons one by one. Crimson examines one of the weapons and realizes that, while not very well made, it has enough potential for a second-rate hunter to eliminate even superior dragons. This makes her imagine how incredible it would be if they could equip an army with such weapons. She then releases her servant, a slime inside her stomach, and finally takes on the appearance of Crimson, eliminating the remaining living dragons. 
Ragma is pleased to see that he was right about her being crimson, and she says she'll accept joining forces with him on the condition that he drinks a poison that will only take effect if he attempts to rebel against her, as his silver power poses a threat, and she needs some guarantee. She tells him to drink it if he truly wants to be used by her, thinking she will have to deliver a convincing speech to persuade the boy. But Ragna drinks the poison without hesitation, which surprises her. She asks why he is so determined to exterminate the dragons. Ragna explains that it's the only way he can protect everything that his future self lost. Crimson comments that it doesn't sound like a very heroic goal because it seems to be for his own benefit. However, that doesn't matter much to her because she will use and guide him on the path to the extinction of their kind, eliminating all six dragon lineages and then their god. But she makes it clear that when their mission is complete, Ragnar must eliminate her to wipe out all the dragons from the face of the earth completely. He agrees to Crimson's terms, realizing that he has heard the same speech from her in his future. With him accepting all of her terms, she says they can start the story of how they will exterminate all the dragons in the world. After reaching an agreement with Crimson, Ragna gets to know Slime better, who appears in his human form to question the way he was speaking with his master. Ragna acts as if he already knew him, which irritates Slime. Slime asks Ragna to address him as Lord Slime because he's Crimson's number one servant. However, she interrupts and asks Ragna to tell her about the future. He explains that they lost the battle against the dragons, but Crimson already knew that and asked Ragna for more details, such as how many dragon monarchs he killed. Crimson bombards the boy with questions he couldn't answer and Ragna explains that he only has a general outline of the future's memory, but doesn't remember details. Ragna says he only recognized Crimson after seeing her, meaning he needed a trigger to access his memories, which Crimson finds quite convenient. Ragna asks if she was suspicious of him, and Crimson explains that she's suspicious of everyone except herself. She then asks if Ragna can use his strength to its full extent or if he can only remember the basics. Ragna explains that his strength doesn't depend on his brain but on his body, allowing him to access his full strength. Meanwhile, a superior dragon is enjoying the screams of the girls caught in its tornado, making him feel even more in tune with the wind. After some time, some dragon hunters engage in battle with the creatures, but they are no longer confident and don't feel like true hunters. At that moment, Ragna appears and swiftly eliminates all the dragons with his silver aura. Crimson expresses her interest in seeing how the boy's power works and immediately Ragna says he will eliminate as many dragons as she wants, but Crimson doesn't want Ragna to do anything. She wants the dragon hunters to handle it. She introduces herself to the people, assuring them that everything will be fine because Ragna, the Reaper, has eliminated all the nearby creatures. She claims the boy is a dragon hunter who has already defeated several superior dragons and she's a mage and his companion. Most of the magic in that world belongs to the superior dragons, but there are a few human magic users, though they are so few that no one knows exactly what magic is despite being aware of its existence. Crimson decides to take advantage of the people's limited knowledge of magic by using her power and pretending it's magic. They believe that Slime, who is devouring the dragon's bodies, is also a type of magic and Crimson invents that he is a pet she created. Everyone is impressed with her power and she encourages them to repeat multiple times how amazing magic is. After repeating the same phrase several times, one of the dragon hunters introduces himself. His name is Michael, and he tells Crimson and Ragna that there is a dragon that only the two of them can defeat. He explains that everyone there fled from a tornado that clearly had a sinister creature inside it. Crimson realizes that the man is talking about the third seat, the third dragon from the top, which personifies the wind named Dizistra. Ragna starts to leave, determined to hunt the dragon, but Crimson stops him by throwing him to the ground. The boy had exerted himself so much that he had completely worn out his muscle fibers in a way that he couldn't even stand up. Ragna had realized how drained he was until she threw him to the ground. Crimson tells Ragna that he needs to remain immobile for about three days and asks him to leave everything to her. She then explains to the dragon hunters that the reaper is injured and unable to move. Michael is worried and asks if she couldn't solve the situation with magic, as they were their only hope. But Crimson explains that if he exerts himself now, he could end his dragon hunter career. Another man asks if she couldn't go in his place and Michael offers her any amount she wants, explaining that they were all willing to sell their equipment. Crimson realizes that they were willing to give up being dragon hunters and decides to have some fun. She declines Michael's offer and asks why they were so obsessed with hunting Dizzy's troll. After all, they were no longer in danger of their lives and could simply move on. She questions why they offered to pay any amount for the two to defeat a dragon that was no longer a threat to them. However, Crimson knew very well why they were doing this as Dizzy's troll had a wide attack range, 
Anyone in its path had to run quickly without a moment to spare. If they all survived a dragon like that, it could only mean they heard people pleading for help behind them but ignored it to escape. After a while, they heard silence because those who begged for help had already been caught by the wind and felt the excruciating pain from its cuts. Because of this, they were now feeling guilty, as if they had blood on their hands. Michael confesses that they indeed went through all that and can't bear the voices of people still sounding in their heads. Everyone had a sense of guilt, but Michael says they knew they couldn't even scratch a superior dragon. Crimson takes this opportunity to remind them of the pride they felt as dragon hunters who protected people. Michael remembers the feeling, but at the moment, they all felt weak, seeing themselves as prey of dragons, not heroic hunters. But if the problem was power, Crimson shows them the solution in her hands, presenting Ragna's Reaper Sword. She says she can't guarantee their lives, but with that weapon, they can gain the power they need to face even a superior dragon. After giving hope to everyone, she asks them to return to being dragon hunters and prepare for the hunt. And so Crimson takes them to the city of Tortier, a place full of debris. As she opens a door with her key, they see a room full of weapons, and Crimson explains that she created it with magic, leaving everyone in awe. They had never seen weapons like those, and Crimson explains that what really matters are the bullets. While Ragnar recovers his body, the men train in marksmanship to prepare for the hunt. At that moment, Crimson notices that Ragnar was acting a bit strangely. She asks if he's worried that she's using people as pawns. However, the boy says he doesn't care about that since he knows Crimson will help them win, despite Crimson repeating that she's ensuring victory, not their lives. Ragna then confesses that he was bothered by just lying around doing nothing, and that he didn't like it when she called him the Reaper because people could lose their lives by being associated with him. Crimson reminds him that Ragna only wants to keep those who are unafraid to lose their lives or can't afford to lose close, and that's why he chose to be with a dragon like her instead of Leo. Ragna says that Leo isn't her concern, but Crimson retorts that she is as Leo was the reason he was in that fight, and that's why she didn't know what would happen if Ragna lost her. Crimson wanted the boy to destroy all the dragons and wouldn't tolerate him giving up on the reason he became a dragon hunter, making Leo important to them once they became allies. Ragna then opens up to Crimson. He explains that he feels Leo is safer near him because leaving the girl alone doesn't guarantee her safety. But even though he knows that, he can't bear the idea of losing Leo right in front of his eyes because just imagining it feels like his heart would shatter. Crimson says she can understand him a little, feeling somewhat pleased. She suggests he should put Leo into one of his empty storage containers so he could render her in a vegetative state, ensuring she doesn't resist and remains asleep in a safe place while he finishes exterminating the dragons in the world. For the dragon, it was the perfect way to protect Leo. But obviously, Ragna doesn't like the idea at all and even tries to punch Crimson with the limited movement he had. Crimson finds the situation amusing and Ragna calls her miserable, but the dragon doesn't care because for Crimson, that's one of her main characteristics. She then mentions how annoying Ragna's attitude was when they first met, acting as if he knew everything about her when he knew nothing. Despite that, Crimson assures Ragna that she will kill Diz's Tra, and that while she does that, he can continue to recover and build his silver aura. Crimson then recalls that he once said he felt cursed. So she takes a weapon and shoots herself in the head. Ragna is horrified, but immediately, Crimson reappears in a new body, proving that she indeed lives under a real curse, and she asks him never to say something like that again. Then she goes to Slime. He says that he extended one of his eyes throughout the entire city as she asked. As a gift, Crimson offers her body for Slime to feed on, making her servant very happy. He shows her everything he saw in the city, explaining that it was all destroyed and the tornado was in the middle of it, with Dis's Chua and many people inside it, floating in the wind. He says there are 16 victims in total, all of them women, all of whom are already seriously injured and lifeless. This makes Crimson think about how lonely Chua it is. But while he was busy, he wouldn't bother anyone, so she decides to take advantage of the situation. While thinking, Slime feeds on her body, becoming very excited. Crimson then says it's time to attack because there are no survivors in the city, making it much better for them. However, she decides not to reveal the entire situation to Ragna and the other dragon hunters. And so at night, Crimson says it's time to attack and gives a motivational speech, telling everyone that that day the true dragon hunters will act and eliminate an evil dragon disturbing the city. Her words make all the dragon hunters celebrate. Then they set out for the hunt, trusting Crimson completely. Dis's Trua notices them approaching and thinks that help came too late because there was no one left there who could be saved. However, no matter how much he wanted to have more fun, Dis's Trua knew that the sun would rise soon and thought it best to leave while there was still time. But Crimson grabs a megaphone to say that they are the dragon hunters who will take advantage of that morning to eliminate an evil dragon disturbing the city. 
She continues saying that the dragon is just a lonely being pretending to communicate with the wind when it's just a monologue. She even says that he is a creature bored of standing in the middle of nowhere by orders of a crazy master. Thinking that a mere human was saying these words, Dissistra becomes irritated that such a weak creature would speak this way of the dragon lineage. He believes that whoever said those words clearly didn't know him, as he is a winged blood a third from the top, the dragon of the wind feared by all for causing excruciating pain with his tornado. The man begins a giant monologue about his superiority, but it only proves that Crimson was right and he was indeed a very lonely being, now wishing to take out his frustration on the dragon hunters. While everyone prepared to proceed with the plan, Michael couldn't help but ponder how they had spent two entire days preparing for that attack, putting complete trust in Crimson and pushing their fears aside. However, as he witnessed the enemy's power, Michael began to doubt whether they could truly face a superior dragon like that. Despite his fear, he stood firm and encouraged his companions to press on. The Dissus Tra tornado was twice as fast as the vehicle they were using. Knowing this, Crimson planned to drive towards the sun, combining the attack of sunlight with a silver attack since only one of them wouldn't be enough to defeat a dragon like that, as his body regenerated faster than it received damage. The hunters followed the plan and fired at the dragon. Contrary to what all the hunters believed, the silver didn't freeze the dragon's blood, but rather the magical power flowing around it. It was the silver that started to freeze the Dizis Chua tornado. However, unbeknownst to him, the bullets were regular, and it was actually the silver aura of Ragna, hidden and recovered, that was freezing his tornado. Dizis Chua thought that this trick wouldn't be enough to destroy his tornado. However, at that moment, Michael fired, this time using a genuine silver bullet. Although the tornado managed to resist the attack, it was significantly weakened. This infuriated Dizis Chua, who still believed that the mere hunters were deluded to think they could face a superior dragon like him. The hunters continued to shoot and Crimson found it amusing. Then, thanks to Ragnar's silver aura, the dragon's tornado dissipated, causing it to fall. Slime captured Dizis Chua and threw him onto the silver lance of the hunters and the dragon began to freeze. Dizis Chua was shocked to realize that the humans had indeed defeated him. The dragon struggled trying to conjure his tornado again, but he was too weak to use his power. As the sun began to rise, the dragon started to burn, successfully concluding all parts of their plan. Suddenly, Dissus Troll managed to break free from the hunters, still impaled on the silver lance, but Crimson ran him over. Too weak to fight, Dissus Troll understood that he was defeated and wondered how a dragon like him could be defeated by mere hunters. After all, he was a super powerful superior dragon capable of creating eight tornadoes at once. Crimson, who knew his abilities, realized that if he had used them, the group would never have been able to defeat Dissus Troll. But his pride had driven him to want to defeat the humans without using his full power, leading to his downfall. Crimson noted that after silver and sunlight, pride was the third weakest point of every dragon. However, even though she possessed all the necessary knowledge to defeat Dizis Chua, the plan was actually Ragnar's. He knew that Crimson had the knowledge to defeat any dragon she wanted and didn't need to know about the future. Still, she wanted to test her knowledge as an experiment. He realized that Crimson was as amazing as she was formidable. Even though they were partners at that moment, once they finished hunting all the dragons, Ragnar would have to hunt Crimson. After they finished eliminating the Wind Dragon, everyone bid their farewells and Crimson erased the hunters' memories, causing them to forget about her. Afterward, Crimson disappeared and the hunters thanked Ragna, saying they wouldn't have been able to defeat the dragon without his help. However, Ragna replied that he hadn't done much and Michael said they could claim that the dragon hunters had achieved the victory. After the hunters left for the border, Crimson showed Ragna a radio. In the broadcast, the royal army of Rhys sent a message to all the kingdom's subjects. All the borders were under attack by dragons, and they were instructed to follow the local authorities' guidance to evacuate to the capital, where they would receive shelter. However, it was explicitly stated that no one should approach the borders. Upon hearing the message, the two realized that it was clearly a trap set by the dragons who were blocking all the exits to lead people to the capital, gathering everyone in one place, so they prepared for a new hunt. Five days earlier in the capital, King Femud Rhys received news that the dragons had destroyed the city of Donapieru and decimated his army. The informant recounted that in the middle of the night, many lightning strikes had struck the city and several dragons had attacked simultaneously. The king instructed the informant to gather the troops and send reinforcements from the cities of Ranaburla and Tortir immediately. Additionally, he asked them to hire as many dragon hunters as possible, emphasizing that they should avoid superior dragons at all costs. The king then pondered the lightning strikes that had hit the city, and his advisor mentioned the similarity to an event that occurred 20 years ago when Garnus's army invaded the Dornapiera region and was decimated by an unknown dragon that shot lightning. 
The king had hoped that the dragons living among them could coexist peacefully and wondered why the dragons were attacking at that particular moment. But he remained calm because the city was protected by a barrier and not even the strongest superior dragon could breach it. Ironically, at that very moment, a dragon appeared. She was a winged girl who looked like an angel. She apologized for her unexpected visit and introduced herself as Artemisia, a first-level dragon from the winged lineage crowned by the dragon god. King Femid recognized her as the dragon with angelic wings known as the King of Wings. Artemisia was pleased with the title given to her by humans. He asked how she had managed to breach the barrier. The capital was protected by a solar wall that absorbed sunlight's energy and converted it into a protective aura, making the city glow even at night, known as the Sunsect Technique. Artemisia reassured the king that the barrier was working perfectly, and that it even made her struggle with the heat. Realizing that his barrier didn't affect Artemisia, the king thought of her as a mysterious being no one knew much about. Fema didn't understand her true role in the war between humans and dragons. Seeing the king's concern, Artemisia assured him that his subjects couldn't move, but nothing bad would happen to them. She explained that she had frozen the world with her temporal manipulation magic to prevent the city from panicking about her visit. She apologized for freezing his city and explained that she did it because she wanted to talk to the king and offer her apologies. This caught King Femid off guard. Artemisia explained that it was never her intention to attack Dorna Pieru, but one of the dragons had done so without waiting for her orders. She was left with no choice but to punish him for his actions and go there to apologize. She said she was sorry for not being able to stop the panic caused by the destruction of Dorna Pieru. Her actions, combined with her angelic appearance and gentle voice, made King Femid question if she was really a dragon. He wondered why he could still move if she had frozen the world, and since she claimed the barrier was working, he wondered whether he should attack her or not. However, Femid thought better of it and concluded that attacking her was not the right course of action. Not only was the winged dragon not showing herself as a threat, but it would likely lead to war against her entire lineage, resulting in the annihilation of his kingdom. The king decided to accept the dragon's gesture and bowed to her. Fima then said he accepted her apologies, Artemisia was grateful and said it only made her task more painful. She wanted to prevent her subjects from suffering and offer a quick and painless end to all of them. This left King Fima in shock. He remembered that Artemisia had said she didn't want to attack the city. However, she clarified that she didn't want to attack the city, but Fimid's kingdom had to be destroyed because that was the will of her all-powerful god. Arnmija said she had planned to do it quickly and discreetly, but the attack on Dorna Pierre prevented her from doing so because the population panicked and some subjects even wanted to escape the kingdom. Therefore, Artemisia ordered her subordinates to go to the borders to block the passage and prevent people from fleeing. King Femin asked Artemisia to stop her subordinates, but she refused to do so. He then asked if she wished to start a war. Artemisia replied that there wouldn't be any war, only the massacre of him and his kingdom, apologizing once more for having to do it. Fumid attempted to negotiate, but Artemisia said it was not possible. So, with no other choice, Fumid decided to act and use the power of the barrier to launch an attack against Artemisia. His ring glowed and it caused all the city's lights to go out, concentrating all the solar energy from his barrier into a single point to strike Artemisia. However, just before releasing the attack, Femid was suddenly attacked by one of his subjects, Borgias, who revealed himself as Artemisia's subordinate. Another subordinate, Nebulime, stepped in front of Artemisia to protect her from anything that could harm the King of Wings. Artemisia thanked Nebulime for protecting her but questioned Borgias, who had fatally attacked King Femid with a devastating blow, as Artemisia had not ordered him to kill the king. She expressed her disapproval of such cruelty and decided to use her power to turn back time to before Borgias launched his attack against Femid. Everything returned to how it was before and she apologized to Femid once more because it had not been her intention to kill him in that manner. Femid was in complete shock, realizing that he was alive again after being certain that he had been killed by the attack just moments earlier. Artemisia then explained that she had manipulated the flow of time with her magic to turn back time before the attack. Femid was awestruck by her immense power, considering Artemisia not just a dragon but perhaps a deity. However, she clarified that she was merely a servant of the true god and that it was the will of this powerful deity to destroy Femid's kingdom. The king then realized that humans could not face even the power of one of this deity's servants, let alone the power of the dragon god. Artemisia said that soon everything would be destroyed and none of them would be able to escape as it was their destiny according to her god's will. She explained that she had a way to spare them from suffering, but she needed King Femid's assistance. Her plan was to eliminate as many people as possible quickly and painlessly. She told Femma that, as a king, he must help guide his subjects. With no other choice, he agreed to help her achieve her goal. The royal army of Lys conveys a crucial message to all citizens. They report a large-scale dragon attack occurring in a city near the border. 
As a result, all citizens from every city should follow the royal army's instructions and evacuate directly to the capital. In the king's castle, a soldier informs his majesty, Femad Reese, that the number of refugees keeps increasing, and at this rate, it would be challenging to continue allowing entry to everyone. The king, with an empty gaze, says that this is not a problem and that everyone should be let in. He reassures that there's no need to worry about the future and that everything will be fine. On the other side of the city, a black-headed figure on a lance comments that no matter how proud or capable a person may be, after they die, they seem to lose their soul. He is referring to the king as apparently, his spirit has disappeared. Then, Artemisia arrives and says that she thought he would be a pile of ashes by now. The figure responds, expressing great happiness at her presence. She informs him about the entire situation. The plan was already in motion, and in ten days, all the people gathered in the capital will have a peaceful death. However, there is a problem. The Minth place, Dornia, was defeated. The culprit was Starly Elise, the second princess of that kingdom. The figure mentions her as the Silver Princess and the Argentum Troop. The queen reveals that she has sent the fifth place and the sixth place after her. The figure questions if she would prefer him to go after her, but she responds that she has another mission for him. The third place, Dissus Troal, the eighth place, Maruhubud, and the tenth place, Grimwelt, disappeared near the southern border. The figure suspects it might have been the Solarian or another dragon lineage, but the elder says it's a completely unknown threat. Then Artemisia hands over her heart to the figure, allowing him to regenerate his entire body. Artemisia mentions that his punishment is temporarily suspended and orders him to subdue the insurgents. It is then revealed that he is the second place, Woltakamui. He accepts but asks if he'll get a kiss as a reward. The queen gives him a smack in the face and tells him that he never learns his lesson. The demon has fun irritating his progenitor. Artemisia urges him to go, but he asks for a moment to enjoy it, as he is a very fast being. Then in the form of lightning, he flies away. Suddenly, we see Ragna from the past in a desolate land surrounded by all the mature dragons. He came there while chasing the winged blood but was captured and pinned down with needles piercing his arm. Once again, he survives without doing anything and starts screaming with anger, but Bordius kicks him in the stomach and orders him to be silent. Borgias asks everyone how they should deal with that human while everyone else had died. He asks for their opinions. Chantiora as the twelfth place is bold and believes there's no other option but to kill him as he sees no reason to let him live. Barong Shura, the eleventh place, suggests making him food for those who want to eat. Grimwelt, the tenth place, suggests stabbing him and exposing his carcass. Dornian, the ninth place, prefers to use him in her experiments since she's developing a new floral arrangement with humans. Maruvabu, the eighth place, claims to have a cruel and unusual murder method. Ultazora, the sixth place, expresses no interest in that terrible and pathetic man, so they can do as they please. Teratectra, the fifth place, is also indifferent. Nebulum, the fourth place, believes they should kill him in the least painful way possible. Disistral, the third place, wants them to finish it quickly, because the human's moans are very annoying. Ragna can't move even an inch. He laments that the only thing he can do is groan. He wonders why he's still alive and didn't die that day with Leo. Ragna is frustrated with his weakness, but at least, this time his life won't be spared, so it's alright. After all, he's tired of everything, and just wants to finally find peace. Woltakamu realizes that Ragna wants to die and lifts him up by the neck, saying they now have a decision. They won't kill Ragna so he can burn in the fires of his own hatred and despair at his weakness. Dissa says he doesn't care about Woltakamu's selfish opinion and tells him to get it over with. Woltakamu questions when they became so soft-hearted. He releases Ragna and asks if anyone opposes his opinion, then Artemisia appears and strikes him with her lance, saying she disagrees with his opinion. The dragon's head pops out of his body with a blow, and he falls to the ground. Artemisia explains that she despises those who disturb the group's harmony and tells Woltakamu to shut up. Artemisia has heard everyone's opinions but asks them to accept her desire. She says she would like to welcome him as part of the lineage. Everyone is surprised and Wolf Kamu, as he puts his head back, questions why she wants that. However, he is hit again by Artemisia and falls to the ground. The queen approaches and introduces herself as Ultimatia, the progenitor of the winged blood. She notices Ragnar's sword and recognizes it as one used by dragon hunters from a kingdom that once existed. Despite being a lovely country, she destroyed all of them, except Ragna, who survived that day and also survived today. She is very pleased and believes it must be God's will, so he has permission to live. Ragna has no idea what she's talking about. Then, Ulto explains that being part of the lineage means an invitation to be transformed into a dragon. The others explain that despite people thinking that superior dragons like them are medial dragons who can assume human form, that thought is entirely wrong. 
In reality, inferior and medial dragons are mere beasts born from their blood. The immature dragons used to be human but received blood from their progenitor and transformed. Therefore, Ragnar should be happy because he will receive the gift of evolving into a life form far above humans. However, Ragnar absolutely does not want to become a dragon like them as they killed Leo and many other people he cared about and could come to care about. Ragnar hates the dragons so much and refuses to become one, but he doesn't have the strength to say a word. Holto says that if he becomes part of the lineage, all this hatred will disappear, just as Ultos did. Artemisia says that despite the nonsense Wolt Camus spoke earlier, she wants to save him from that hell. She creates a blood blade with her powers and says she will stab it into his heart. When she does that, the transformation will begin. Ragna uses his last strength to beg her not to do it, but she asks him not to be afraid, as he won't cease to be himself. However, the way he sees the world will change. Artemisia plunges the blood blade into Ragna's back, piercing his body and going straight to his heart. His transformation begins and he screams in agony. So Ragna wakes up startled in a train carriage next to Crimson and Slime. He mentions it felt like he was having a fun dream, so he didn't wake him. He also tells Slime to keep quiet. Crimson asks if he remember anything useful. Despite Crimson being a jerk, he's still better than Ultimatia as her gentle demeanor while killing countless people is terrible for Ragna. He promises to hunt her down no matter what it takes because he's stronger now. Crimson still doesn't know how much of his own power Ragna can use and he's also unaware of the price that must be paid to use it to its full extent. So he prefers to wait a few years and fully prepare to kill Ultimatia. However, the queen must already be aware of the strange activity near the border and by now, Wultakumlu must be free because he's the most powerful fighter of all. Without his protection, this is the perfect time to set an ambush against Ultimatia. So if Ragna defeats the queen, it's a bonus. But if he loses, Crimson will save him because he's an irreplaceable tool. The train approaches the capital, and they plan the next steps of their operation and how they'll secure an audience with the winged progenitor. In the capital, through a vision, Artemisia asks God, who appears as a child, if he wishes for everything in Lise to be destroyed. The child asks what Lise is. Artemisia deduces that this country no longer exists in God's mind. Therefore, everything in this world that isn't in God's mind must be obliterated. After all, they are God's members and the lineage exists for that reason. She weeps for all the members of the lineage who have died because none of them served as God's members. They weren't fit to be part of the lineage. She pleads to at least let the destruction of that country be an offering. Amid the citizens, Smile is impressed by the size of the capital. Crimson explains that they are in the new district, the commercial center of the capital. It's the most bustling region of the city, and they are just crossing the second castle wall to enter the old district. Moreover, Crimson asks that from now on, they address him only as Veronica. When they look to the side, Ragman is vomiting. He explains that he gets sick in crowds. Crimson thinks it's a joke and an improper weakness, given that he survived in Ronabera, which is also a large city. Ragna tries to remember and recalls that the reason was Leo, who had always been by his side. Crimson questions if they should cancel a hunt due to Ragna's condition. However, he promises that he will be fine because no matter what happens or how sick he is, the moment Ultimatia enters his line of sight, he will hunt her. So Crimson supports Ragna on his shoulders to continue. He asks him to pretend that he's Leo by his side, but Ragna says he will never be like Leo. After some time, the trio arrives in the old district. Crimson prepares for the operation, but Ragnet is very unwell. So he asks Slime to stay and take care of Ragna until his return in two hours. Crimson orders Slime not to get into trouble, move unnoticed, and not mention the enemy's name out loud. Crimson leaves the two and moves through the crowd. He notices that despite the many people, the flow of evacues should have already exceeded the city's limits. He wonders how it can still accommodate more people. There's only one explanation. They are gradually reducing the number of people by secretly eliminating citizens. Meanwhile, Nebulon finishes the selection of people for the day, just waiting for nightfall. Borges asks where the progenitor is and Nebulon replies that she went to see the situation of the evacues. Borges is furious because it's their duty to oppose the queen's whims. Nebulon explains that the progenitor is in the old district. In another part of the capital, Lieutenant General Rowan enjoys dinner with two beautiful women. He flirts with the ladies and suggests they go up to his room. However, Crimson arrives and asks if he can join the conversation, already knowing Rowan. Minutes later, the lieutenant is on his knees asking Crimson, calling him by the name Veronica to notify him when he's coming so he and his servant can prepare a proper reception. However, Veronica smacks Rowan and reminds him that he ordered him to gather information while posing as a high-ranking army officer, but seems more focused on having fun. So Veronica asks another servant named Chimera to appear as well. She comes from outside the window, transforming from a feline to a human, and pledges her loyalty to her master. 
Then Veronica explains that everyone needs to cooperate so that Ragna can kill the winged monarch. In the midst of the crowd, Ragna and Slime watch a military performance. The soldiers lower a large curtain, revealing petrified dragon heads that start to catch fire. The captain promises that the Royal Lace Army will kill every last dragon and keep its population safe. Ragna steps away and bumps into a hooded girl. He looks in his shock to realize it's Ultimatia. Then he remembers what Crimson said earlier, if he ever encountered her, he should, under no circumstances, fight her alone. If that happens, the hunt would be over. Sensing Ragna's odd behavior, Ultimatia approaches and asks if he's feeling unwell because he looks extremely pale. Crimson informs his servants Golem and Chimera that Ragna will be fighting Ultimatia. Therefore, they all need to cooperate so they can kill the winged monarch. Golem questions this as he thought their only job was to keep an eye on the blood of the wings while they destroy the country. However, Crimson reveals that he has discovered something intriguing called Ragna, and because of that, the situation has changed. At that moment, they had a great opportunity to hunt down the winged monarch. Golem gives advice saying they shouldn't challenge Ultimatia now. However, Crimson disregards his advice and the servant becomes indignant. Using his reconnaissance drone, he saw the exact moment when the winged monarch took control of the capital while using her time control magic. Golem asks his master how he will overcome something like that. He asks him not to worry as only Ragna will fight, not them. The boy's combat skills are greater than those of the two servants. Thus, Gollum is relieved to have such a powerful ally, but he remains concerned. He can't help but wonder what it really means to be strong when facing the power to control time. Meanwhile, Ultimatia encounters Ragna and asks if he's feeling well because of his appearance. Ragna is torn by his thoughts as a part of him wants to follow Crimson's instructions and avoid the fight, but another, manifested by his past self, wants relentlessly to attack Ultimatia at that moment. She is alone and this is a great opportunity, even though she shows no apparent hostility. He is hesitating, but his thoughts are consuming him from the inside. Back with Crimson, Golem and Chimera bicker like children. The servant asks for permission to do the job alone, claiming that her partner is overwhelmed by Cordis. He calls her a brainless bird brain beast, and she finds it amusing to hear that from a noisy pile of scrap metal. Golem starts teasing her by asking her to solve basic math problems, and while he can answer quickly, she struggles. He doesn't tire of taunting his colleague until Crimson approaches and smacks him with his fan. Like a mother separating her children in a fight, Crimson tells them that they are works of art he created with his knowledge and skills, even though he used different approaches for each. Therefore, insulting each other is the same as spitting on their master. Crimson forgets what they were talking about and Gollum shows his fly-shaped drone. The servant uses the drone to project images of the winged monarch using her time control magic. The three of them are impressed by the power of time control. Then Crimson asks Gollum to self-destruct, leaving him shocked and confused. The master asks if he's insinuating that Crimson is acting like an obsessed fool with his new toy. Golem realizes the problem he has created for himself and becomes afraid, but Crimson says it would be inconvenient for him to do it now, and it's better if he explodes during the battle. He begs for mercy, and the master loses patience and kicks him to the ground. Crimson then reveals that the time control magic is not invincible, and those images are proof of that. Elsewhere in the country, Walter Kamui arrives in his lightning form and encounters the group of warriors who fought against Tra. He is upset that the dragon was hunted down by those idiots. The warriors are frightened because they realize that this dragon is superior. Walter Kamui says it's clear from their faces that they already know it's their time to die. He demands that they tell him everything they know about the guy who gave them those silver swords. They are free to refuse to provide the information if they have the courage. In the city, Ultimatia continues to stand in front of Ragna, who is paralyzed. Slime advises Ragna to keep his distance, as this guy might end up vomiting on her. He mentions Ragna's nausea and crowds and calls him a real wimp. The monarch apologizes and says she didn't realize. Slime accepts her apology without any issues and says that we all make mistakes. Ragna has his hand on the hilt of his sword, hesitating, but ultimately decides to give up. He won't fight, and he sees it as a better option to find Crimson and hunt down the monarch again later. In a very friendly manner, Ultimatia apologizes for the inconvenience and asks him to take care of himself. Despite this being a good moment, Ragna believes that this is the right decision. He almost acted rashly when he was alone, but thanks to Slime, he didn't take any further actions. Slime approaches Ultimatia and senses a different scent from humans, which seems delicious to him. He jumps off Ragna's shoulder and asks for permission to lick Ultimatia's face. However, the boy accompanying her intervenes and stands in front of Slime, reminding her to hurry up and find her parents. Slime becomes curious and asks what the boy was talking about. Ultimatia explains that she was helping him find his parents. 
Ragna is inwardly furious to hear this, as he remembers all the harm that the monarch has caused throughout his life. He can't believe that someone like her is being kind to that child. Ragna asks for the reason but quickly regrets it, as it might raise suspicion. Uncomprehending, Ultimatia asks if there needs to be a reason to be kind to someone. Ragma reflects for a while, but then he pulls Slime and asks them to leave. However, Ultimatia calls him and asks him to wait, wondering if they have met somewhere before. Before she finishes the question, Ragna denies it shortly and continues on his way. Then Nebulim arrives, looking for Ultimatia. He is relieved to find the monarch after searching for a long time. The Elder is furious, and she apologizes for the trouble she caused. But before they continue their conversation, Nebulim asks who the guy is, pointing at Ragna and suspecting he might be a dragon hunter. Ragna places his hand on his sword and alert for what might happen. But the monarch explains that she initiated the conversation, and that he was just feeling sick in the crowd. Nebulim then recalls that this kind of thing is normal and happens to many people, including him. Remembering it, he gets sick and vomits in the middle of the square. Ultimatia is concerned and suggests they find a less crowded place, but as she looks back, she realizes that Ragma and Slime have disappeared. While they review the footage, Golem and Chimera wonder why the winged monarch is not visible. Chimera realizes that after appearing suddenly, the room changes completely. She concludes that Ultimatia stopped time up to that moment. The question is, why did she choose that moment to resume the flow of time? At first, Golem thinks she may have run out of magic or perhaps there is a limit to how long she can freeze time. But then Crimson explains that at that moment, she only reversed time for the injuries that led to the death of King Lees. Despite her immense power, Ultimatia cannot pause and reverse time simultaneously. To reverse time, she must unpause it, and while she is in the process of reversing it, she cannot pause it. Therefore, this is the weakness of time control magic. Crimson envisions a scenario in which they plan an ambush and kill the monarch. If they do that, she will automatically use her magic to reverse her body to a living state. However, while she is doing that, she cannot freeze time. So before she finishes restoring her body, they kill her again. The magic is triggered again, and time is reversed. They kill her again and again and so on. If this continues, her magic will run out and she won't be able to turn back time. Naturally, to defend herself, Crimson hopes she will counterattack using her energy reserves. That's why Ragna must be able to defend himself and kill her. Crimson recalls the conversation they had by the campfire, and if it's true that they killed the winged monarch in the future, this must have been the method used. The only direct lethal aspect of time control magic is the inability to use different powers simultaneously. This is the only way to confront the monarch at the moment, so Ragna is capable of defeating her in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation. Golem and Chimera's role is to take care of Nebulim and Borgias, preventing the dragons from helping the winged monarch. They must be cautious, as this is a great responsibility. In Ali Slime asks what's gotten into Ragna. He ignores the servant and questions if he made the right choice. Despite the fact that his future self wouldn't have hesitated, Ragna is different, he hasn't lost anyone yet. Then a representation of Crimson emerges from the shadows and reminds him to stay calm and obey his orders. Although he convinces himself that he made the right choice, Ragna still has a horrible feeling inside him. He asks Slime to transmit a message to Crimson using a communication device. The message is that he found the target. Crimson then goes out alone, leaving Slime astounded. Meanwhile, Crimson realizes that his servants still don't trust Ragna. This is understandable since a new human without loyalty is playing a central role. However, the mage is not worried because he has been sending subliminal messages to Ragna since the day they met. On a day, he gives the order, the hunter will ruthlessly kill whomever he wants. Crimson then receives a desperate message from Slime. The master asks what it's about, and upon realizing that Slime failed to follow all of Crimson's orders, Slime decides to speak out, saying that the stupid human betrayed them. In the square, Ultimatia and Nebulim return the lost child to his parents. She thanks him for the help, and he affirms that the monarch had no selfish actions. Ultimatia asks if that family was included in the list for that night, and Nebulim confirms, saying that the three of them will disappear. The monarch is pleased because this way she can make people inside the barrier disappear without feeling pain. Although escaping death is not possible, pain and fear can be avoided. Ragna listens to all of this and becomes furious. He approaches Nebulim from behind and says he wants to start over. He reveals that the reason he was sick before was actually the fear of not being able to use his power fully to accomplish his mission. Ultimation apologizes because she had no idea what he was talking about. Then she calls for Nebulim, but realizes that he has been frozen. The petrified dragon's body falls to the ground, shattering into pieces. Ragna wields his sword, ready for the fight, and apologizes to Crimson. If he doesn't fight at that moment, his oath to kill all the dragons would have been in vain. 
Finally, Ultimatia realizes that this man is her enemy and assumes her angelic form. She begins to invoke her magic, but before she even notices, Ragna hits her with several swords and kills the monarch. Time control magic is activated, and she starts to regenerate her body, but before it is complete, Ragna strikes her and destroys her body. The monarch is thrown away. The citizens are in panic and flee, the magic is activated, and the rewind begins once more, but it takes 2.88 seconds to complete. In that time, Ragna kills her once more with his silver sword. Ultimatia is killed so quickly that she doesn't even have time to express her feelings. She decides to counterattack, but Ragna is more powerful and hits her numerous times. He tells her she can rewind time as many times as she wants. The monarch tries to use her powers, but Ragna is much faster, and before she can release her magic, he impales her with his silver swords all over her body. Ultimatia summons a blood blade and threatens to plunge it into Ragna's heart, asserting that when she does so, the transformation will begin in him. She embraces Ragna, consoling the hunter, assuring him that he won't cease to be himself. Still holding Ragnar in her arms, she thrusts the blade through his back, claiming that his worldview will change forever. An intense reaction begins in Ragnar's body. As he screams in pain, his veins bulge, and the inside of his body pulses in blue and red. He declares that his body is so hot it burns from the inside, and everything irreplaceable to him is gone. Ultimatia tells Ragnar to forget his hatred, so that they can live for the sake of God. Among all the things she could do for him, this was the final atonement. Ragna's transformation intensifies, and an image of Leonica appears in his mind, indicating that he will forget her, just like all the other things that matter in his life. He realizes what is about to happen and reacts by trying to grab Ultimatia, but she manages to move away. Soon he sees his broken blade on the ground and leaps to retrieve it. Zora and Nebulun react to try to stop him. Kazaster Thrower begins casting a wind magic spell, but Kamui holds his arm, preventing the magic. Consequently, Ragna manages to lift the broken blade and thrust it into his own heart, piercing his body and removing the blood blade Ultimatia had stabbed him with. He says his life was meaningless but that he wouldn't let Ultimatia have her way. With the blade in his chest, he falls dead. Members of the lineage realize that Ragna is dead and some wonder why he didn't accept Ultimatia's kindness. The progenitor admits she was mistaken and Ragna was not destined to join their lineage. Dying there was his salvation. Disaster Thrower massages his sore wrist and asks what happened. Kenemy says he just wanted to enjoy the show. Ultimatia approaches them unnoticed and catches Disaster Thrower's attention, making him startle. She asks him if he can take everyone home through the wind since wind is not the strong point of the rest of the group. Disaster is embarrassed, turns away from Ultimatia and says of course he can, asserting that the wind is the most grand and elegant means of transportation, especially for a beautiful woman like their progenitor. The monarch smiles and asks a disaster thrower to convey her thanks to the wind, and disaster responds that he will tell it for her. Zora overhears the conversation and comments that Tro is very cute, while Borgis mocks, asking when disaster will be able to talk to the progenitor without acting like a clown. The wind dragon begins casting his magic to take the lineage away, but before leaving, Ultimatia tells Kamui that their lineage brings the world closer to what God desires and expresses gratitude to all those who have departed, wishing them to rest in peace. After everything is passed, Slime and Gollum arrive at the battle site. Slime sees Ragma's lifeless body but being far away, thinks it's just trash someone threw away. Crimson approaches and tells Slime not to touch the body, deciding whether it's garbage or not. Crimson kicks Ragma's body with his foot to look at his back and sees the blade stuck there, realizing that he froze his body to prevent him from becoming a member of the Wayne lineage. Crimson asks Gollum to carry Ragna back to base and his servant asks if they will dissect the found body, but Crimson says he will revive the dead because he seems interesting. Back in the capital, Golan tells Crimson that the explosions from the conflict are a true spectacle. He turns to Crimson and asks about the plan, but Crimson is distracted, muttering the word cursed repeatedly, when he starts getting more and more nervous, calling Ragna mediocre and saying he escaped his expectations. He begins shouting alone, wondering how, among the millions living in this stupendously large city, they manage to find Ultimatia. He starts questioning if he's cursed. However, he quickly calms down, stating that the original plan was to assess Ragna's power, and if he manages to win, it will still be a victory. If things go wrong, Crimson will handle it. Crimson says that Ragna is really different this time, which shouldn't be a surprise. Camera contacts Crimson, reporting that Borgius destroyed the second wall of the castle in the southern old district and entered the new district, giving him an advantage. She finishes by saying there is no sign of the superior dragons. Crimson privately wonders if Nebulum is dead since, just before the battle started, the shield around the capital disappeared. He quickly orders Chimera to return and contact Slime, 
telling him to go to the nearest location with a delicious scent. Gollum informs Crimson that Bordius left the castle and Crimson asks the servant to deal with the dragon. The man is astonished and asks how that would be possible in his current body, but Crimson simply informs him that there is no time for him to change. Golem regrets not being able to use his combat body because it was limited and dangerous to face a dragon of Borgias' caliber, but he complies with the order. He climbs onto the parapet and timidly says that it may not be possible to kill Borgias, but Crimson replies that he just needs to delay the dragon. Golem reminds Crimson that the installation is complete but hopes not to have to use it and sets off for the mission. Crimson remembers that all the orders he just gave will be useless if Ultimatia does that, Scenes of the fight between Ragna and Ultimatia flash in her mind as she states that she wants to see if Ragna can really press the monarch so much, calling him a mediocre man. Within Crimson's thoughts, the head of the winged monarch appears, questioning if she has already died many times. Almost disintegrated by Ragna's blows, she worries about not having enough time to come back, fearing dying definitively. As she is about to be completely destroyed, Borgus appears, apologizing for the delay. He announces that he will drain all the blood in the castle and fire his cannon. He apologizes again when he warns that his leader will be hit in the explosion because Ragna cannot be defeated without drastic measures. Before he can fire, Borgius is surprised and his cannon is cut in half by an unknown attack. Golem at a distance fired at Borgius' cannon and mocks the dragon, saying Borgius was excited for nothing. Golem jumps and sees Ragna fighting Ultimatia, concluding that he can really defeat her. However, Ragna is surprised by a counterattack from the monarch. Ultimatia casts a restriction barrier on Ragna, preventing him from moving. Nebulum is injured on the ground, noting that the Silver's freezing power of this enemy is off the charts, realizing he went from dead to nearly dead. Very weakened, with part of his left arm cut, he tries to motivate himself to endure a few more minutes and struggles to get up. Elaborating a strategy in his mind, he reflects that he just needs to buy enough time for Ultimatia. The Monarchs, slowly restoring her body, thanks Nebulum, expressing gratitude, relief, and sadness announcing that she will go back 3.1 seconds in time. As a precaution, she invokes the repugnant life force that flows from her blood in the form of hundreds of blood dragons and tries to envelop Ragna. Ragna, in turn, reacts with the silver full power, and the restriction barrier begins to break. Nebulim sees the monarch's barrier breaking and realizes he needs to act quickly. He declares that he will sacrifice his life and tries to endure a few more seconds, but Slime calmly approaches and swallows him, giving the restriction barrier enough time to break completely. Despite this, Ultimatia's restoration is complete, and she thanks Nebulon for it. Now she prepares to end the fight. She concentrates to summon creation, but Ragna reacts quickly, hitting her with the silver flight. The monarch's body disintegrates almost completely again, but a vision of Kamui invades her mind. He calls her weak for a dragon monarch, criticizing her for taking one to two tenths of a second to stop time, saying that in their world, a tenth of a second is the difference between killing and being killed. Ultimatia asks Kamui who they are referring to his words. Kamui asks if it's not obvious, answering that it's him or anyone else who has reached an insane level of power. With a powerful kick, Ragna throws the rest of Ultimatia's body out of the capital, saying that he doesn't need to hold back anymore, and begins to punch the winged monarch. While the blows happen, Camus continues to talk to Ultimatia in her mind saying that if she ever faces someone very strong, he wants to be by her side to support her. But if he isn't there, she should use the foolproof card she has up her sleeve. She just needs to remember and execute the trick. With difficulty, Ultimatia stammers, but soon manages to issue a command with her voice, ordering all of creation to rewind, causing time magic to act once more. Suddenly, we see Ragna opening his eyes with slime on his shoulders, hearing an announcement from the authorities of the capital about exterminating the invaders from his homeland, restoring peace once again to his people. As the authority speaks, the people go into ecstasy, cheering for the people of Lees while watching dead dragons being displayed for the entire population. Slime claims that these stupid humans are getting too excited, and that he could devour this crowd in 60 seconds. Ragna seems confused and realizes that something is wrong, but he doesn't know what it is or how to act to find out. Ultimatia appears beside him, saying that she has already stopped time and that it takes an enormous amount of magic to turn the world back, so she rarely does it. She concludes that he is a very big threat, so it needed to be done. Ragna was such a big threat that she felt death approaching. That said, she informs him that the battle is over, but quickly corrects herself, saying that the battle hasn't even happened yet. She questions how to deal with him and who he really is, that the deep hatred he felt for her was evident and wonders when she caused this hatred in him. The monarch laments thinking that she will never know the reason and concludes that it is in this inner world that Ragnar will face his death head-on. 
Simply raising her arms, she levitates the entire population of the capital, frozen in time, playing with them as if they were dolls. But she asserts that she won't stoop to cruel killing, even if they are people who disdain God. She continues saying that when Ragna was low on brain matter, he was honorable and fought alongside the people, and asks him who the child he carried on his shoulder was, suggesting that Ragnar and Slime had a friendship as Slime was affectionately seated on Ragnar's shoulders. The monarch begins to utter a phrase involving Slime and removing the boy, but before she can finish this threat, Ragnar moves a finger of the hand holding his sword, and the sound of the blade startles the monarch, who steps back a few steps. Unbelieving in what she was seeing, Ultimatia wonders how it's possible for Ragnar to move as she didn't feel time turning back. Nebulim appears in his dragon form and delivers a punch that sinks Ragna and Slime into the ground. Nebulim's enraged eyes show his hatred as he repeatedly punches the dragon hunter. Even taking these blows, Ultimatia sees that Ragna is not moving, so she presumed that his movement was just in her head, and she is relieved. She corrects herself, saying that, as a progenitor, she cannot allow such a thing to happen. The monarch approaches Nebulim and asks the dragon to stop his blows, noticing that his arms were covered in various burns. Nebulim's punches and open a hole in the ground, and in that hole she saw a puddle of the purple liquid. She says that the liquid seems to be an acid that dissolves their bodies, and that this seems to be the true nature of the child. She concludes that it will harm them if they accidentally touch the acid. Nebulim is concerned and questions his progenitor as Ragnar was still alive and was a great threat. Ultimatia agrees but rebuts Nebulim, saying that she has tested various abilities in her last fight against Ragnar. But he broke through all her defenses and her attacks were ineffective against the hunter. Furthermore, she shows the dragon that even though he has now beaten Ragna without him resisting, no injury was fatal, as if Ragna's body were a powerful silver sword. Even though Ragna wasn't wielding silver, she imagines that he carries the source of this power within his own body. His power is incredibly resistant to magic, and it seems that only a magic with world-destroying power would be effective against him. As they are weakened by the sunlight, Ultimatia asserts that it would be difficult to defeat Ragna in these conditions. Ultimatia contacts Borgius and asks him to deliver a message to King Femid Lees, as she wants the king to unleash the light on Ragna. She believes that the offensive function of the barrier will be much more effective than a magical attack. Borgius accepts the mission but warns his progenitor. There is at least one more enemy present besides Ragna. Ultimatia responds that she will deal with him after she deals with Ragna. The progenitor turns to Nebulum, who is visibly shaken by the difficulty of the situation. She motivates him, saying that she will always depend on him, and what is to come will not change that. She asks him to put up a barrier to protect the people in the surrounding area because the range of the light attack may exceed what she can anticipate. Crestfallen, Nebulum understands and withdraws while his leader looks again at Ragna. She feels strange about it, but she knows that she has developed affection for Ragna, even though he's an enemy now, as if it were a diluted version by those of her bloodline. As Ragna killed so many dragons, a monarch feels disloyal for having developed this affection for the hunter, and she promises to forget this feeling when she has killed him. Already resigned to her affection for the enemy, she steps back and wishes that he has a painless and peaceful death, bidding farewell to his paralyzed body. Memories of old duels between Ultimatia and Ragna emerge from the blood blade she thrust into his heart to the transformation he prevented from taking over his body. Every time he was attacked but never gave up, resisting magics that everyone thought impossible to survive as if he could move his body only with the strength of his promise to annihilate all the dragons in the world. During one of these memories, Ragna surprises Ultimatia by standing up after a devastating blow, swearing that he won't let the opponent live. She doesn't believe he is moving during her time control magic. She tries to push him away with magic, but it seems that nothing can hold him. Meanwhile, she remembers that now, in addition to King Lys, the only people in the world that she allowed to move are others who share her blood. In another memory, Crimson appears, saying that the monarch can choose to exempt people from the effects of stopping time, people like the members of her own bloodline. Soon the scene returns to the battle between her and Ragna, where the hunter can move freely despite time control. Nebulon tries to protect his leader using the strongest enhanced protective barrier he could invoke, but Ragna easily pierces the defensive magic. Ragna approaches the winged monarch and asks how she can cower with so many deaths at her hands and attacks her with numerous strikes of his conjured sword, cutting Ultimatia into pieces. She manages to turn back time again, but once again, Ragna is in full condition to move, which despairs Ultimatia. With Nebulim in her hands, she tries to devise a strategy in her head, but her possibilities seem to run out as all her actions are overcome by Ragna. Fearing death, she despairs and calls for Camus. Ragna is about to eliminate his two enemies when he is brutally interrupted and starts bleeding absurdly. 
He realizes that using too much of his future power had serious consequences on his body, unable to continue the fight and falling to the ground. Controlled by Borgias, King Teats orders the barrier to unleash the Aurora Beam, causing massive damage to the capital. Confident, Borgias asks Nebulim if they manage to defeat the enemy, but he replies that no, stating that there are new enemies. A woman accompanied by a panther approaches Radma's fallen body, and Nebulim cannot see her face to identify who she is, but is crimson, in another of her disguises. Borgias asks the progenitor to stop time again, but she is so frightened that she cannot react. Crimson tells Ragna that he lost, that he obeyed his orders but ended up in this lamentable state. Then she turns her head and wonders what she should do with Ragna now. Crimson observes that Ultimatia took an approach focused on combat because for her, battles are merely empty endeavors and tests of strength are wild. However, at the same time, the queen had utmost confidence in her own time control magic, believing that her power could face any display of brute force. Yet all the assurance she felt was shattered during her fight with Ragna, which left the girl completely destroyed, ceasing to be the winged monarch and becoming only a woman petrified by battle. Crimson wonders what Ultimatia will do now as this was her opportunity to get rid of the enemy. However, the girl was in shock and all she could think about was whether there was a problem in the formulation of her magic or if it was the way she was using this power. Nebulon calls out to his queen, trying to make her regain consciousness but without success. Borgias also tries to call her name, even though he's far away, but all the girl can think about is whether she should try to use her magic, even though it had failed. In an act of desperation, Ultimatia unleashes a huge light around her. Crimson admires her courage and decides to further destroy the queen, determined to eliminate any belief that may still linger within her. He then activates a button that causes the entire city to suffer from a massive explosion. Everything begins to crumble and Crimson revels in the scene as it inflicts immense suffering on Ultimatia. All the people whom the winged monarch wished to give a peaceful and painless death ended up meeting a horrible fate of chaos, suffering, and panic, exactly the opposite of what she wanted. Crimson caused massive destruction, aiming to expose what lies behind Ultimatia's mask of compassion. The cries and sobbing of tens of thousands of people were before her, making it impossible to sweep this horrific situation under the rug as she desired. Crimson continues causing destruction, hoping that Ultimatia would take action in the face of such cruelty. The girl panics at the sight of all that suffering and considers using her time control magic to save everyone, but Nebulon prevents her, knowing it's a trap. If she went back in time at that moment, it would deplete all her magical power, leaving her completely defenseless and falling into the hands of the enemy. Realizing that Nebulon thwarted his plan, Crimson decides it's time to retreat. He begins to withdraw along with Chimera, who carries the still unconscious Ragna. Meanwhile, Ultimatia still suffers from the pain of the people before her, Understanding that there is nothing she can do to prevent the devastation, accepting the cruel fate that everyone faced. However, even knowing that people had to die, the girl cries because she wished she could have at least spared everyone the torment. Back to Crimson, he walks through the chaos he caused without showing any reaction, finding his servant, Gollum, in an alley. He informs that he created a door exactly as Crimson asks and begins to praise his master's actions, stating how impressive he is. Crimson responds to the praise by hitting him in the face with a glass bottle. He says that the Great Clock Tower should also have a bomb implanted, and there weren't enough explosions on the castle walls, asking why this happened. Golem apologizes and explains that there are many places in that area he likes to visit, but Crimson is not pleased with the response and injures his servant again with a glass bottle, saying that if the devastation had been greater and more fatal, Ultimatia could have fallen into the trap and used her magic to go back in time. Golem apologizes again and thinks that he was afraid Crimson had changed after meeting Ragna for no reason, as he continues to be the same boss as always. After that, Crimson turns the key to his secret door and asks Golem to get rid of that body to monitor the subsequent movements of the lineage in its base form. Golem questions his master's order as that was a task serving only as punishment. However, Crimson maintains his order and instructs his servant to endure the suffering. Next, he enters the door, ending up in a white room with Chimera and Ragna, called the Global Chamber. Meanwhile, Ultimatia still suffers from the pain of the people, and Nebulum wonders what he achieved in that battle, feeling powerless and useless for not having done anything to help his queen. He then remembers a conversation he had with Borgias about the maturation period, called the Thirteenth Seat when someone is not yet a member of the Dragon lineage, adapting to their progenitor's blood. Borgius tells Nebulum that the blood of the wing refers to these beings as the 13th seat, and this period roughly measures someone's potential as a lineage member. He explains that Ulta Zora spent a year in this maturation period, Dissus Chua only spent a month and Kamui less than two days, 
while Nebulim didn't even go through this period because his pure aptitude as a lineage member surpasses even that of Old Camus. Bordius tells Nebulim that eventually he will become the backbone of the lineage and the main supporter of their progenitor, and the boys should be aware of this and be proud. But at that moment, Nebulim sees no reason to feel proud of himself. After all, he failed to protect his dear queen, and even though he supposedly knows he has the potential to surpass Kamui, he still feels like a failure because he knew they wouldn't be in that situation if Kamui were there. Nebulim then decides to change that and show his strength, preparing to go after Crimson. The dragon feels that Nebulim is looking for him, but even knowing his excellent potential and that his magic can sense that he is in another spatial plane, Crimson remains confident that he cannot be located because he himself created the global chamber during his peak, which is basically a portal connected to all parts of the world. Crimson thinks that even if by some miracle Nebulim manages to locate that place, it's impossible to break through the protection using external forces. He then goes to the portal and reflects that despite things not going as planned, it had a result that exceeded his expectations. Next, Crimson prepares to escape and devise a new plan because for him, there's nothing more to be done for that country. While still unconscious, Ragna remembers one of the hunts he had with Leo. They were after a dragon and despite the imminent risk of running into a horde of dragons before dawn, Leo insists it's worth the risk. The creature they were hunting showed potential danger if allowed to live long enough, possibly evolving into a superior dragon. Despite finding the idea of facing a superior dragon fun, it would be irresponsible to let a dragon cause havoc just for the thrill of a fight. Ragna wakes up extremely weak and struggling to stand. Despite his condition, he gathers the remaining strength, knowing he is in Crimson's teleportation room, refusing to give up the fight without defeating Ultimatia. Crimson tries to calm him, acknowledging the excellent results Ragna achieved in the battle, proving to be stronger than expected. However, Ragna doesn't care whether he pleased Crimson or not. All that matters is that the winged monarch is still alive. Ragnar activates his silver power and Crimson quickly orders Chimera to stop him. She restrains him and the dragon scolds the boy for attempting to destroy the place when he notices Ragna cause a small crack in the room. He hurries to use the teleportation. But at that moment, Nebulim appears. Crimson acknowledges underestimating the boy and attempts to escape, but the portal is closed due to damage to the room. Furious, he orders Golem to attack the enemies. His servant, outside, shoots Nebulim, severely injuring him. However, Borgias retaliates with a massive fireball. Ragna finally frees himself from Chimera, and he and Nebulim vow not to let the enemy escape. Crimson becomes irritated seeing Ragna helping the dragons ruin his plan, but the boy doesn't give up the battle, increasingly activating the power within him. Crimson starts to dream of a conversation he had long ago with a girl. She says there won't be peace even after the war, but she would like to continue living with everyone else. A military training field in the northeast of Lys, a princess named Starlia Lys eats dragon meat, reflecting on the absence of dragon attacks. The major calls her and she goes to him. He questions the princess eating dragon meat, but she defends it as retaliation as dragons feed on people. A woman calms her hair while Major Isaac Stern explains that the teleportation circle they prepared underground attracted someone. The princess asks if it's a dragon, but he believes it's not, yet wants her to judge with her own eyes. They have captured Crimson, who being taken as a prisoner, thinks about their misfortune of being expelled from the glow chamber and ending up in an entirely different exit than expected, blaming Ragna for their situation. Crimson is taken to where Princess Stalia is, she welcomes him and asks for a detailed explanation of what happened from one of her men few. He reports drawing the magic circle, and two guys appeared suddenly. Despite this, there was no damage to the circle and their mission was unaffected. The princess finds humor in the situation but realizes someone else appeared with Crimson and asks where that person is. The Major explains he is in critical condition, not able to speak, but they confirm through a blood sample that he is not a dragon. Isaac allowed the boy to receive medical treatment in exchange for Crimson answering all their questions. Stalia decides to deal with Crimson first, asking him to eat a piece of meat as a sign of goodwill. Crimson is taken aback but can't refuse in that situation. After some time, he thanks her for the food and takes a bite of the meat. Later, the princess reveals that it's dragon meat she hunted herself. Crimson immediately vomits the food, thinking about how strange Starlia is. She was born without arms, but her eyes could sense the aura emitted by all things. Thanks to this ability since infancy, she could move objects freely, controlling them with her power, even without arms. The first time she did it, she moved a set of cutlery, earning her the title of Princess of Cutlery by her people, who believe she's a miracle granted to the world by the Sun God. The girl's fame is so widespread that half the world knows about her. At six, she defeated three lower dragons. At seven, she hid her identity to compete in a combat tournament, which she won. 
By eight, she killed a horde of dragons, including two medium ones. However, the princess didn't stop there. At nine, she thwarted a coup attempt by a general, and after turning ten, she used her special abilities to develop silver equipment, quickly becoming a master craftsman. Currently, at 16 years old, she commands the Argentum Corps as a combat unit with equipment she created herself capable of killing even Dornia, a superior dragon. However, Crimson's hatred for Stalia is not related to her strength, but to the fact that she is extremely difficult to deceive. The princess states that she will begin the interrogation and asks Crimson to answer carefully because lies won't fool her. Stalia then asks who he is and how he arrived at that location. Crimson thinks that this is an opportunity to resolve the entire situation since he knows that the Argentum Court is planning to escape the country through the teleportation circle. They are being pursued by Ulto, Zora, and Terratectra, two superiors they cannot face, leaving only the option to flee. In this situation, their objective aligns with that of the dragon. The problem is Stalia's starry eye is receptive to aura, which contrary to popular belief doesn't mean silver but all life since all beings produce their own aura. It's challenging to deceive Stalia who can see changes in aura accompanying the emotions of a being and use this ability to determine the sincerity of people. Crimson thinks that a good way to handle this problem is to include a lot of truth in a small act, though it's quite challenging. It's a way to deceive the princess. He thinks this situation is unfair as he's in it because of Ragna, while the boy sleeps like a baby. Stalia questions Crimson's lack of response considering whether she should take it into account. He apologizes immediately. The dragon is annoyed with himself for wasting time thinking unnecessarily, but celebrates as Stalia didn't notice his irritation, meaning his plan to deceive her would work. Crimson then reveals his dragon eye to everyone and begins to use his acting talent to deceive the princess's eyes. Seven years ago, we see Princess Steria talking to a lieutenant colonel. The man seems uneasy about the girl's presence and asks what she wants. The princess then says she wants to eliminate him, and that's exactly what she does, with a smile on her face as if it were a child's play. This was the story Crimson learned about her. As this incident was committed publicly, people thought the child was a bit crazy. However, after investigations, it was discovered that the man was an infiltrator from an enemy country preparing a coup. When asked how she knew, Hysteria simply replied that she only needed to look at a person to know if they should be eliminated. In the present, everyone is surprised by Crimson's dragon eye. Deep down, he knows it was the right choice because these people are familiar with magic. Many humans born or becoming mages have some non-human part in their bodies. In his case, the eye adds credibility to the lie. Faced with a woman capable of sending him to his demise if she suspects anything, there was no other way out of this situation. Crimson introduces himself as Krish Weiss, a mage who hides his identity and works as a pharmacist. When asked about the situation in the capital, he puts on a frightened expression and says everything was going well until there were explosions. While saying this, Crimson controls his emotions, subtly reflecting in his aura, showing that he is afraid and hiding some things. About the capital, he mentions many explosions at once and she doesn't know the current situation because she was trying to evacuate with an injured companion using teleportation magic. Hiding that the explosions were his fault, Krish says it was when they suddenly found themselves in the magic circle. One of the men questions how the mage learned magic since no one does it alone. The guy suggests she deserted the Sun sect, but this aligns with Crimson's script. Now is the time to show some uneasiness. He pretends to be concerned, saying he never belonged to that elite. The guy concludes that he is right, commenting that the sect does not tolerate deserters, so it's no surprise he wants to flee to a country outside their influence. With this, the redhead thinks he has imposed his identity since the Sun Sect is the only human faction capable of facing higher-level dragons. This leads him to believe the conclusion of this situation is for them to accept him as an advisor to the group due to his supposed past. However, it won't be that easy. Staria says he lies very well, mixing lies with real facts. She mentions her ability to detect liars because her eyes see a person's aura, perceiving fluctuations caused by strong emotions. This is not true as with training, aura can be controlled. What she sees is the color of the aura. Honest people have a blue aura and dishonest ones have a red one. This makes it very difficult to deceive her. In Crimson's case, the aura is not red, it's actually very blue, but it smells really bad. This comment surprises Crimson, but he continues trying to talk his way out of this situation. Suddenly, the princess puts the broadsword in front of him and he pretends that she always offers equipment to people who please her. The redhead falls for it and puts his hands on the hilt. However, this confirms what the princess already knew. Staria says she was born without arms but compensates with this silver equipment. The power of the equipment allows her to see people's nature much better than with her eyes. As an example, she talks about the guard next to her, who looks too serious that's his true nature, he is too serious. It's so noticeable that it becomes transparent. 
As for the man in the back named Garm, the sword wolf, who taught the princess to fight, she sees that the sword and the man seem to be one, the result of years of training. With all this, she concludes that a person's true nature encompasses all their experiences and cannot be hidden. About Krish's nature, when she looked through the sword, Steria only saw death and darkness. Having said that, the girl asks how many people Krish has eliminated and also determines that the explosions in the capital were caused by the mage. Crimson tries to deflect, but it doesn't work. Also, there's no way to seek intercession from the princess's followers, as they are entirely subservient to her. Steria prepares to attack, saying she is happy to have met this person and to be able to eliminate her. Outside, Crimson screams in despair, but inside, he is fine because there's no way to die anyway. After the elimination, he can hide in their base and wait for the opportunity to escape with Ragna. Suddenly, when the broadsword is about to hit Crimson, Ragna appears and holds the blade with one hand. He says he won't let them take his prey and throws the sword aside. Despite not knowing what's happening, Crimson thinks Ragna has messed up something again. At this moment, the nerd wonders how the boy managed to infiltrate and notices Garn lying there. Out of nowhere, the princess also falls to the ground completely astonished. While the governess tries to help her maintain composure, Ragna asks what Crimson did to the princess, but the redhead says this time it's on him. Anyway, the guy thinks he didn't do anything either. The truth is, the princess sees Ragna as a giant sword with arms and legs. This infuriates the followers and they attack, but for Ragna, it's not even a challenge. Steria is still impressed that he merged with the Silver Aura, a sign that he is beyond the peak of swordsmanship. Seeing how the princess looks at Ragna, the governess recalls when she announced the end of the detention after the incident years ago, and the girl revealed that she barely noticed the time passing while forging a sword on her own. While the girl boasts of having a talent for forging, the woman says the incident scared off all the princess's suitors. Steria doesn't care because she never intended to marry, but the governess has the duty to take care of the princess's education. She feels like she's training a wild animal. The truth is, when the girl gets married, she will receive a handsome reward and will be able to enjoy life the way she deserves. Saying that, the girl suggests finding an absolutely incredible suitor for her if the governess is so eager to see her married. Back to the present, that's exactly what the princess sees in Ragna, admiring his muscles and scars in addition to the silver aura. She acknowledges that she has never seen someone so powerful and serene at the same time. Despite seeing a sword in place of a head, she finds his face very beautiful. Blushing, the girl tries to ask the governess for advice, saying that this man is magnificent. The nerd thinks it's just a joke or that the man enchanted the princess. Crimson is also surprised. When Ragna tries to talk to the girl, she hides, thinking she was staring too much at him and that it might seem strange. She still seeks help from the governess, but the woman is also somewhat lost. Suddenly, the guy starts speaking like a caveman, but it's because he's just repeating what Crimson is saying in his ear. Thus, he ends up saying that he doesn't intend to fight and will follow all orders as long as no one else tries to eliminate the redhead. With that, the duo ends up in a cell. They take the opportunity to talk, but in Crimson's way, with his foot on Ragna's head. The redhead asks why the guy ruined his plan and Ragna says he didn't want to escape because as long as Ultimatia lives, innocent people will continue to die so he needs to defeat Ultimatia soon. Anyway, the redhead says it was time to escape and also mentions that Ragna messed everything up, destroyed his hideout and now no one knows where Gollum and Chimera are. When Crimson asks how he plans to fix all this, Ragnar responds that it will be by eliminating Ultimatia. Crimson steps even harder on the guy's head, who says it's starting to hurt. He then says he's just restoring the flow of his aura as Ragnar exerted himself too much in the previous fight. Having said that, the guy thanks Crimson because when he recovers, he can return to battle. Crimson complains about the guy's stubbornness. Suddenly, Ragnar asks about the slime. In fact, Crimson forgot about the servant but quickly reconstructs it faster than preparing instant noodles. The guy is confused but happy to see Crimson's face. He says it shrank and weakened because of Ragna, who apologizes. Now the question is where they are exactly. Crimson explains that it is a military base in the north of Reese, installed in the complex of a lost civilization. However, the residents are in a dangerous situation, and the explanation might discourage them from returning to the capital. Meanwhile, civilians complain about the situation to the guards. They want to know what's happening and want to see the princess. The truth is, these people were brought without explanation and are living confined. This could turn into a riot. The nerd says it was better to bring them to prevent them from falling into the trap of going to the capital. But leaving that aside, the nerd wants the other guy not to tell anyone about the intruders. It turns out that the mage the princess condemned to immediate death and the warrior who defeated Garm in the blink of an eye are too powerful and can shake the morale of the troops. The guy asks for payment for his silence but the nerd refuses to bribe a colleague. Suddenly, another duo appears running to ask about Garm's defeat. 
It was him who told them when they found him crying in a corridor. Since Garm is the most powerful swordsman in the kingdom, losing to a young man must have been a big psychological shock. The shorter one, named Shin, gets excited to face the person who defeated Garm. The mirror tries to force them to make the reports before saying anything, but he doesn't have much authority with these guys. Suddenly, two blonde girls appear asking about the princess being in love with the intruder, and it seems that Ragna is the talk of the moment. The princess, on the other hand, is indeed thinking about the swordsman when the governess rebukes her with a slap. This is to show how distracted she is by passion since she should have easily avoided the attack. Before admitting, the princess says the woman's muscles have atrophied her brain and compares her to a gorilla. The governess proceeds with another attack and tells the girl to admit it. Staria continues to compare Ragna to a sword and is surprised to be attracted only by a man's appearance. The woman says it doesn't matter the reason, the fact is that she found love. However, the Silver Brigade is powerful and managed to gather a strong group, uniting soldiers, guards, dragon hunters, mages, and assassins under the same banner, all because of the princess's leadership. Passion should not be harmful, but only if Steria does not neglect her responsibilities, as the world needs a figure ready to shine under this burden. Upon hearing this, the girl declares herself as such a figure. In the meantime, Ultimatia is having a vision in which she apologizes to the deity for being defeated. Soon, the girl transforms into her sister, asking why she wasn't saved. She wakes up from this nightmare and tries to use her time control power, but can only freeze for a few seconds. In the base the Silver Brigade gathers, Princess Staria requests reports from the blonde, Christopher, and the short one, Shin. They begin explaining that the dragons are acting strangely. There has been no activity until this morning, but it doesn't seem like they have malicious intentions. They got close to the dragons and noticed that the creatures wouldn't immediately attack if a signal were given. The twins remark that it feels as if the creatures are occupied and resembles a funeral. After careful thought, Steria suggests it's a good opportunity. She believes the dragons don't intend to let them escape, or they would have lifted the siege already. Some problem must have affected the higher-ranking dragons. She asks the girl with bangs, Majorca Abbott, how long it will take for the teleportation circle to be ready. The girl replies that according to Fu, it will take one day if everyone works themselves to death, but realistically, it will take two days. Upon hearing this, the princess orders them to finish in one day without anyone going to the base. She also declares that the country has already lost. On the first night, the capital and five more cities fell. No one knows how many citizens were devoured by dragons. The only option now is to escape with the 1,500 citizens gathered in this place despite it being shameful. It's a way to show the dragons they can't always do as they please. She concludes the speech with a motivational phrase. At this moment, the Dew of Prisoners arrives with Crimson sarcastically praising the speech. With the princess mortified, Shin and Christopher confront Ragna, but the nerd tries to downplay the situation. He advises everyone to behave. Assessing the skill level of this group, Ragna concludes that there are people even stronger than Leo in this place. When the nerd asks about the guards of the cell, Crimson says he asked them to let them pass, and they kindly agreed. Getting straight to the point, the redhead says he would like to help with the escape plan. He knows the intention is to use dragon blood as a source of magical energy for teleportation, and despite being a solid plan, it won't work. He explains that the enemy's military power is much greater. Crimson ends by saying he can provide information about the dragons and better yet, can provide a super weapon capable of taking down superior dragons alone, which is the Reaper, Ragna. Furthermore, if they don't cooperate, everyone in this place will probably meet their end. The princess is completely paralyzed by Ragna, leading to a discussion where all brigade members speak at the same time. The tutor finally knocks the girl on the table with a blow, bringing her back to her senses, and she dismisses Crimson's words as nonsense. As she approaches, she leaves a board between the prisoners. Shin loses patience and asks if they should finish off Ragna. He looks behind the wood to try to talk to her, and Steria becomes embarrassed again. Crimson then seizes the opportunity to mention that the Mad Maestro, Ulto Zora's main role is to manage and lead military affairs. His power is chemical synthesis. He can create potent substances that eliminate or hypnotize targets through changes in his own blood. Moreover, Ulto can spread the compounds like a mist, covering a large area. However, these chemicals neutralize instantly in sunlight and silver can also stop them. Another piece of information is that he can use his ability on his own forces, making them much stronger and maintaining total control through hypnosis. Staria says there is no guarantee that this information is true, even with her ability, she prefers to be suspicious of Crimson. He then brings Ragna into play as Crimson is entirely incompatible with the princess, so Ragna has a much better chance of convincing her. In a flashback, the Dew in the Cell discusses the situation. Crimson calculates that at least 10,000 dragons will attack the base transported by the Twisted Shadow, 
and the leaders will be the superior dragons, Ulto Zora and Terra Tectra. The base has only 350 soldiers to protect the 1,500 civilians, meaning no one will survive. To confirm this prediction, Crimson asks if Princess Silverware and her companions were in Ragna's future. Crimson's proposal is for Ragna to forget Ultimatia for now so they can escape the country. Ragna will do what he can to ensure the humans in this base escape the dragons. The decision is Ragna's. In the present, Ragna shows he has already made his decision when he begins talking to the princess. He mentions the insults she directed at Crimson, agreeing with all of them, calling him despicable and worse. Despite everything, the only thing to trust about Crimson is his desire to slay dragons. And that's why they joined forces, to exterminate all dragons. Furthermore, Ragna introduces himself as the world's best dragon hunter and asks to be used by the princess. The princess is taken aback but her expression reflects the effort she's making not to scream yes in response to the request from the man she has fallen in love with. Finally, she manages to hold back and speak seriously, agreeing to the proposal but making it clear that it's all for strategic purposes and has no sentimental motive behind it. With this scene, Crimson bursts into laughter and then praises Ragna's move despite thinking he went too far with the insults. Steria's followers are unsure if this is the right decision, but the girl is entirely determined. Crimson is excited to finish off these dragons and says he will modify the plan. However, Steria states that Crimson's function will be simply to provide information about the dragons, and she will be the one to plan everything. Crimson says that's a great relief but advises her to be careful not to leave holes in the plan for him to fill later. Setting that aside, the girl asks if Crimson knows what caused the dragons change an hour ago. The redhead then says it's because they fought the winged monarch in the capital. It's probably causing a commotion, making them run to the capital. In the meantime, Ulto Zora and Terra Tectra attack Bogios to inquire about the current location of the progenitor. We then see Ultimatia being visited by Wolta Kamui, who, with a head in hand, comments that she lost control of time and mentions the unpredictable power gained from another person. Ultimatia asks how he got through Nebulum, and he says Nebulum let him in without any issues. Then he extends the head for her to recognize him as the leader of the warriors who eliminated Troa. Walter Kamua comments that the man wasn't very strong but had a good end. He wants to reveal the words the warrior said before being eliminated, but Ultimatia isn't interested in the last words of someone who met a cruel fate. Walter Kamui, who sees no value in anyone, says the man was weak but remained a dragon hunter until the end. Anyway, since she doesn't want to know, he decides to keep it to himself. Suddenly, he grabs a sword and offers it to her, saying he took it from one of the dragon hunters. Ultimatia is startled while Woltakamu mentions that he has to make an effort not to get a numb hand while holding the object. The monarch asks him to remove the sword, but he is so persistent that, without realizing it, she takes the object and delivers a strike, leaving a vertical silver mark. He then comments that she is holding the sword. Upon realizing this, Ultimatia feels the chill of the object and immediately lets go. Now, Woltakamu begins to talk about the reason she can no longer control time, a simple thing. She lost it in her heart. He explains that magic is a way to change the world and requires three things. Magical power to create change, a process that gives direction to the change, and confidence to control the change after it has occurred. It's a mental block, and he suggests that she probably visualizes the enemy mentally when trying to use the power. The monarch mentions that the enemy could move even when she stopped the world. Walter Kamui confesses that he doesn't know why the opponent didn't stop, but the reason she can no longer stop the world is that she lost it in her heart. It's basically trauma. Hearing this shocks Ultimatia, who wonders what she must do to regain the use of time control magic. Woltakami then responds that she needs to forget the fear, giving the example of the sword that frightened her but that she suddenly took without hesitation to attack him. At that moment, the monarch forgot about the fear because of the anger she felt. Despite the explanation, she says it's not that easy when it comes to this trauma. Thus, Woltakami tells her to command him to destroy the source of her fear. Ultimatia is silent while he insists and asks what she wants him to do until she decides not to give that command. She determines that losing the ability is simply her personal failure, so she cannot use her greatest weapon, Woltakamui, to regain the power. Now the priority is to destroy this country, so that the world can be shaped according to God's will. This is her only function as the Wayne Progenitor. With this, Woltakamui tells her to say what she really wants, which is revenge. The monarch is a bit confused and suddenly, he puts her in bed and says he will tell her what he really wants first. He says he is furious that someone tried to eliminate his woman while he was away. Ultimatia then takes the sword and hits him again because of the bold comment. Enraged, she continues attacking and says that if he doesn't intend to listen to her, 
he can go fight. However, he says he wants to fight under her orders, he won't lure himself because she's the progenitor or worship her like a saint. He only sees the monarch as an unbalanced woman whom he follows by his own will, not caring about divinity or loyalty to their lineage. Ultimatia can act however she wants with him, whether furious, childish, or dramatic, he will always endure and remain by her side. As for the progenitor, she doesn't think she can allow that as she has duties to God and the lineage, besides the people they exterminated. Wolterkamli takes advantage to say that his interest is in hearing what she wants him to do. The monarch starts crying and ends up asking for their heads as she can't stand this situation anymore. She doesn't find it fair that they are still alive after the suffering they cause. So that's the order, she really speaks like an unbalanced person. Wolterkamli takes the sword and squeezes it so hard that it breaks, finally saying that her wish is his command. The duo leaves the room to Nebulum's joy. Ulto Zora, already on site with Terra Tectra, receives a hub from the progenitor. She takes the opportunity to ask if Nebulum is okay, still thinking that Wolterkam will use brutality to get in. While the two argue about what really happened, Nebulum confirms that he let him in without any issues since, in that state of the progenitor, only Wolterkam could help. Meanwhile, Wolterkamui himself remembers the hunter saying that the Reaper would come after him. This gets him excited to fight Ragna because when they face each other, it will be a deadly battle that will go down in history. So, Ragna infuses the sword and hands it over to Princess Starlia for a test. She asks Ike to strike the weapon with his sword, but he only manages to crack it in half. Everyone around is astonished by such resistance and Christopher comments that it was indeed a surprise. With that, we see Crimson placing hands on Ragna's shoulder, asking the boy to witness what this sword can do, as it was only infused with a bit of silver. The princess asks if this effect lasts for a long time, and the protagonist explains that it diminishes as the sword is used. The power of silvering tends to deteriorate weapons it touches over time, but due to the high quality of this particular sword, the princess won't need to worry about that. Starlia responds that of course the sword won't break because it's one of her best creations, and she adds that his silvering is decent enough. Hearing the conversation, I comments that at least the boss learned to talk like a human with this kid. Starlia defends herself, saying that she's only saying these things for military purposes, and that it has nothing to do with any kind of sentiment. And Ragna, not understanding anything, just says okay, while Ike says that's a bizarre way to deal with it. So the princess decides to bring all the weapons to Ragna. After that, the enemy jumps to March 8th, where Ragna is training with the Silver Brigade, facing various opponents from the battalion. As Ragna defeats his opponents effortlessly, the others become increasingly furious. Despite winning without any effort, he questions if it's really worth training with infused weapons, recalling that Crimson once advised him to save half for personal use and the rest for infusing the corporation's weapons. Moreover, he said that Ragna won't use the silvery battle arts in the next battle because nothing good could come from it. Ragna acknowledges that he's not in the best physical condition, but it's not like he's disabled or anything. Since he has to face numerous dangers alone, why couldn't he use this ability? Speaking of things he doesn't understand, he wonders why all these people are attacking him with such anger when he hasn't done anything to make them nervous. Meanwhile, one of the members of the Princess Cutlery Appreciation Club is in tears, wondering what the commander sees in that stupid boy. Over time, more people become enraged with Ragna, while he just wants to end it quickly and return to his cell. Until Shin Cutlass, the chief swordsman, appears. Full of arrogance, he approaches Ragna boasting that he's not like those amateur swordsmen. However, he is quickly defeated with a single blow, and a second later, he's lying on the ground like a rotten banana. Interestingly, Ragnar recognizes that the opponent was strong since he couldn't even infuse silver against him. And within his mind, he reflects that this Shin guy is on the same level as Leo, if not a few levels above. Embarrassed by the defeat, Shin runs away from the fight in tears, shouting that he doesn't need Ragnar's pity. At that moment, Majorka Abbott is in the circle, egging on the next person to enter the ring, until someone punches her on the head to make her stop talking nonsense. In an isolated corridor, Christopher scolds the two warriors sitting down for being advanced swordsmen crying like children. Shin gets annoyed and says he's not crying, but Christopher continues to provoke. So the dual sworded boy tells the blonde to go into the fight since he's so good. Calmly, he replies that he has already lost and received his silver-infused weapon. After all, powerful warriors need powerful weapons. With his new equipment, he feels like he could cut a superior dragon like butter. To mock the man, Shin responds that there is a big difference between being strong with a strong weapon and becoming strong just because of it. But Christopher doesn't let it go and says he knows what the boy is feeling because Ragna is extremely powerful, even at such a young age, stronger even than the commander, making Shin feel the difference between effort and natural talent. Shin threatens to yell, but Garm Ulban interrupts the discussion and states that Ragna doesn't have natural talent. 
In fact, it's the opposite. Despite their brief fight, the old man felt that this defeat was Ragnar's greatest achievement in training, a man without talent, and that this feeling is unmistakable. Then the blonde discovers the reason the old man is sad because he thought it was because the princess had fallen for that boy. The old man, even sadder, recalls that this is painful too. With that, Shin gets up and declares that he's tired of these two old farts crying over spilled milk, so he decides to challenge Ragna again as he doesn't want to be the bystander behind a glorious hero on the battlefield. By nightfall on the same day, the twin sisters Greya and Hesela are questioning Ragna about what he thinks of Miss Leah, and in the background, Shin had just been defeated for the seventh time. Ragnar responds that he doesn't have a formed opinion about this woman since he just met her. Still, they keep bothering him, saying that you can still have an opinion about someone even if you've known them for a short time, like finding the person attractive or ugly. For example, Aunt Leah thinks Ragnar is handsome. With that, the scene shows that each one has their hand on their holster. Trying to argue, Ragnar explains that his face is covered in bandages, so there's no way the princess can know if he's good-looking or not. But he goes further, stating that he's uglier than hitting your own mother, and this fact is making him increasingly worried. With that said, the girls respond that he only speaks the truth under pressure and draw their weapons. Thus, they ask the boy to infuse their bullets with silver. Without paying much attention to the request, Ragna thinks that the two are the same age as Leo until slime in miniature suddenly appears on his head, asking where that dragon smell is coming from. Ragna scolds his friend, asking if it's really a good idea for him to appear like this, while the twins think slime is a cute gnome. Later, they ask what his name is, and the boy replies that it's evil slime, saying that the twins look more like dragons than humans because of those eyes and teeth. With this, Ragnar realizes instantly that the mood of the girls has changed, and the two invite the innocent slime to eat some tasty snacks. Slime agrees, but only if it's a snack dragon and asks to be taken to a snack bar in Anshi, so they fulfill the boy's wish. As everyone moves away, Ragnar feels an uncomfortable sensation that you will never see slime healthy and in good spirits again. Then the twins take Slime to a dark storage room and close the door, while the boy asks where the dragon is. In response, they tell him that they have no memories of their parents. Their first memories were of being in a freak show in a circus, and they were an attraction known as the Dragon Descendant Twins. The two were treated very poorly by society. Growing up in such a hostile environment, they became emotionally stunted, losing the meaning of humiliation. This means they don't feel anger from Slime's insults, but they chose on their own to get nervous. However, the twins say that they won't kill Slime, but rather play a prank on him. Far away, Master Fu reflects that magical powers are the means to direct the changes they create. And with a trick, he conjures fire into his hands. However, there are other methods to shake the world. He reflects that for those who master the method, there are various ways to manifest a kind of power. For example, superior dragons are masters of the most powerful form of magic, and the blood that runs in their veins is a form of magical expression. Simply by imagining the change they desire, they can conjure the magic they are thinking of, which is why they are powerful, to the point where Thaumaturgy tries to imitate them. Magical circles are shaped from the flow of dragon blood. The center of the circle is the heart, and magic circulates through the veins. The more knowledge the magic bearer accumulates, the more powerful they become. This is the call of the Thaumaturge. After all this reflection, the scene cuts again to him, frustrated with something, but sitting at a table with several Thaumaturges like him. At this table, everyone discusses that their teleportation method is malfunctioning and each one offers a more foolish solution than the other. Meanwhile, the leader observes his subordinates and laments that their brains have turned into pancakes from working day and night. Therefore, he suggests that everyone use imagination and creativity to overcome the teleportation problem, as recent research has led nowhere. However, one of the subordinates reminds them that the dragons are supposed to arrive tomorrow, so there's a risk that there won't be time to fix the circles until Crimson appears at the table and explains that he is there because Few needs him to solve this little problem they are having. After that, in an isolated field, Ulta Zora comments to Terra Tectra that he didn't understand when a foolish woman claimed she would save him from suffering. Nevertheless, it happened exactly as she said. The fire of hatred burning within him was extinguished. While having these memories of when he was human, he regrets not feeling the emotions that should accompany those memories. The only thing he feels is a deep affection for the dragon monarch, who stole everything precious to him. And the most shocking part of all this is that he doesn't even feel ashamed to admit it. So he turns to Terra Tectra, who once was Arnaldo, and asks what he thinks of all this. The other dragon replies that there's one thing that hasn't changed. They are still warriors and comrades in arms. Having said that, he decides to swear never to experience the humiliation of losing his sovereign again, even if it is the dragon monarch who stole this human sovereign. Whether man or dragon, that doesn't change his purpose or his way of living. 
As Tyrotector speaks, we are going back to the past, where he and Zora discuss the plan. Ulta remembers that there are two things that need to be done. Destroy this country and kill Reaper and his friends for daring to attack Tia. Watching the conversation, Ulta Kamui interrupts the reasoning and calmly states that they don't need to worry about Reaper and his friends because he will handle them alone. But Zora shows disbelief and calls his companions stupid for thinking that way since Tia is without her time control powers and weakened. If she dies, it will be the end of all dragons. Therefore, facing all enemies with only one member is foolish. But Kamui remains confident, and while insulting Zora as stupid and other things, he responds that he doesn't take orders from him and reminds that the queen asked him to deliver the heads of the enemies. Then Ulta Zora turns to the monarch and asks if this is really true. Ultimatia regrets and confesses that she gave that order but starts to back down, causing Wolt Kamui's revolt. The second in the lineage asks the princess if that heated discussion they had in bed meant nothing and the princess, embarrassed, responds that she wasn't in her right mind at that moment. Zora interrupts and asks what kind of talk that is and Wolt Kamui retorts that he doesn't owe an explanation to any old witch. Interrupting the fight, Nebulon comments that they don't need to look for the enemy because they will come to them. Zora asks how he knows that, and the boy responds that it's just a battle intuition. As he speaks, memories of his fight against Ragna invade his mind, making him affirm with hatred that he will protect the princess at all costs. To provoke, Zora praises the boy's courage and comments that he has finally become a little man. Shortly after, he points his finger in Kimmy's face and shouts that he should follow the same example. Kamui doesn't like it and calls the other a gothic witch, starting another fight between the two. Haltimatia interrupts the discussion and asks if Kamui and Nebulim stay, who will destroy the country, since fulfilling God's determinations is more important than her own life. Boldly and shaking his silky hair, Ulta Zora says to leave it to him but asks the queen to understand that he no longer intends to be merciful with humans. The original plan was to gather as many humans as possible in the capital and have Nibu's barrier erase them all without suffering or fear. After doing this in the capital, they would move on to the next city and do the same. But this would not be possible without some dose of violence. Convinced by the argument, Ultimatia decides not to question the methods of the lineage. From then on, it was without mercy. This response satisfies Zora, but he continues to recite the plan, saying that they should order the 40,000 inferior and median dragons in this country to attack the enemies. However, to calm his commander's anxiety, he says that despite everything, control will be maintained through a medial dragon. Then he declares that he and Tara will deal with the Princess of Cutlery and delegates Borgius to lead the Dragon Squadron as long as he doesn't kill everyone because they need to find out who attacked Tia. Having said that, Kamui asks if they are forgetting something. Then he supposes that perhaps Reaper is working with the Argentum Corps, but Zora replies that if that's the case, he will call Kamui, and the guy needs to appear at the speed of light. Meanwhile, Borgius reflects on how half of his lineage went down the drain, but the remaining members are all reliable and capable of protecting the progenitor, today and always. Until Zora turns to Terra and asks him to join the discussion, then the dragon completes that they must see themselves as members of the progenitor's body, and none of these members can be missing under any circumstances for her health. Having said that, he laments that the lineage has already suffered a huge humiliation by losing half the group and demands that none of those present die under any circumstances and above all, that everyone fulfills their mission. In a warehouse, Princess Starlia demonstrates a magical technique that forms a cage from silver pieces. This technique is supposedly effective against dragons, making it difficult for them to move around. Putting that aside, Ike takes the opportunity to ask the princess for her opinion on what Krish Weiss said about defeating three of the superior dragons at once and battling the monarch dragon in the capital. Upon hearing this, the princess mentions Ike's vision problem metaphorically stating that everything Krish said is clearly a mix of truths and lies. Therefore, one should not be distracted by non-essential information. Ike accepts the advice but reveals that there's something he can't ignore. What the redhead said about the superior dragons once being human and gaining their powers through the monarch's blood. According to Crimson, even Ulto Zora and Terra Tectra were once famous human warriors. Regarding this, the princess confirms it as true, stating she had suspected it as well. She uses the twins, Majorca and Fu as examples, saying that individuals born with high levels of magical power often have non-human characteristics, and the more powerful they are, the more pronounced these characteristics become. So the question remains about the fact that the highest ordered dragons are so similar to humans. They are not imitating humans, but rather humans who have become dragons. Contemplating this, Ike is apprehensive about the upcoming battle. But Starlia says it's easier to fight when dealing with a different species. After all, humans hunt other animals for food, so they shouldn't worry about this information about the superior dragons. 
The fact that they were once human only gives more reason for this conflict, so Ike should not hesitate. These are the enemies that must be eliminated for their survival. Meanwhile, Ragna wakes up from a nightmare and asks Crimson what time it is. The redhead replies that it's 3 a.m. on the ninth day. The two then catch up on each other's progress, both doing well in their respective roles, especially Crimson, who believes he helped the magician significantly with the teleportation circle issue. Leaving that aside, he mentions that Ragna is wondering why he advised against using Silverine Battle Arts, a silver art. But before answering, he asks if Ragna could defeat Wolt Kemi if they fought right now. With some difficulty, Ragna admits that he couldn't. Crimson is relieved because his partner at least has that much sense. Wolta Kamui is formidable even among the superior dragons, so it's better for Ragna not to confront him at this moment. Moreover, this is the reason for not being able to use Silverine battle arts. The adversaries already know Ragna is a human emitting Silverine from his body, and a common superior dragon wouldn't stand a chance against him. If they discover Ragna's location, Ulta Zoro won't hesitate to call Kamui, who will undoubtedly appear instantly. In the current situation, that would be a certain defeat. Therefore, Ragma's only option is to try to save as many people as he can. Meanwhile, Ike descends a ladder and enters a corridor. When he finds Fu acting strangely and asks who the woman is that ended up making the circle much better, Ike thinks it's good. However, Fu feels humiliated because, in their interaction, Crimson proved to be much more intelligent than him without any arrogance. The circle has improved so much that Fu no longer feels like it's his creation. Back in the cell, the twins return the poor, shattered Mr. Slime to Ragna. After going through all this humiliation, the little one becomes quite sad because he lost the pride of being a superior life form above humans and dragons and having gone through all that. Ragna didn't even know Slime had any sense of pride, but Crimson soon arrives in the cell and asks why the guy returned to this place. Ragna says he can only relax in this location. In any case, Crimson confirms whether the guy saved half of the silvery in his body and tells him to infuse all the remaining in a single weapon for him to use. In this case, he just needs to take a sword from the princess but must do it as deep as possible underground to avoid drawing attention from the lineage. Before Crimson leaves, Ragna asks to talk to Mr. Slime who is in bad shape. What the redhead does is slap him so hard that the little creature splats on the ground and then gets up all happy, as if it doesn't remember anything. The wizard confirms that only a good hit is needed for Slime to forget any bad memories. That said, he tells Slime to keep an eye on Ragna until the end of the imminent battle. Next, the wizard says that the battle will probably start around sunset, so it's good to prepare as quickly as possible. Before leaving, the princess appears. She asks Crimson about the people who were suddenly becoming discontented but have calmed down. But the wizard says he knows nothing. Anyway, there's also something the girl wants to discuss with Ragna alone. He follows her through a corridor and then she says that normally she would prefer to create a weapon just for him. Unfortunately, time is short so we'll have to settle for one of the ones she presents to him. Ragna praises the quality of the swords, and the girl boasts that even though they are mass-produced, she made them. In any case, there's something she needs to tell him before the battle starts. Meanwhile, the tutor secretly observes that the girl is meeting alone with the man she likes. Starlia tells Ragna that after the battle, she will join the Solarians. Even if the plan succeeds and they escape with all the soldiers and civilians, the future would be uncertain because it's difficult to feed more than a thousand people in an unknown country. So the only way to solve this is to become a member of the Solarian Church and become a dragon hunter so that in return, they protect her people. Ragna then asks if she knows what the Solarians are like, and the princess responds that they tried to recruit her once. She was not pleased with the offer and refused, but the situation is different now. The problem is that if she loses her life in this battle, the people will have no future even if they manage to escape the country. That said, she decides to ask Ragna that if she doesn't survive, he should join the Solarians in her place and lead her people and the soldiers. Of course, the boy isn't obligated to do this, but Starlia pleads with him to grant this request, and in return, she can do anything the guy asks. Ragna immediately refuses because he doesn't like this religion, so she'll have to become the dragon hunter on her own. The girl says she couldn't do it, and this leaves Ragna wondering why she's acting as if death is certain. Starlia says she has always lived based on her intuition rather than common sense, and that's what made her who she is today. Deep down, she recalls that since they began facing the blood of the wing, she has had this premonition that she is destined to die at the base, but she doesn't want to show this weakness. Therefore, she says that as a commander, it's natural to prepare for this kind of situation. Now changing her stance, the princess becomes more authoritative, abandoning the desire to make him like her. She points her swords at the guy and comments on him saying that she could use him. So the guy is her subordinate in this battle and must obey her. With this, Ragna thinks about how incredible the princess is. During battles, he rarely thinks about dying at the base and when he does, 
He imagines that it would be okay if it happened. The princess, on the other hand, is fully prepared for the worst, making him see her as much more capable than he is. And finally, as he always wanted people like her to survive in his place, in response, Ragme uses Silverine's battle arts, putting the rest of his power into the three swords and says that Ulto Zora, Terra Tectra, and the dragon army will perish before his blades. Almost crying, the princess suddenly flies away, leaving Ragna confused. The tutor asks what's happening, and the girl says that her swords are completely unworthy in the face of his effort. With all this, and after the compliments, the girl feels completely humiliated, but this increases her determination not to kick the bucket so soon to still get stronger and forge great swords. When the dragons start to appear, the citizens of the capital wonder why the creatures are coming out of the royal palace. And soon the attack begins. For some reason, the soldiers remain motionless and then start firing at the population. It turns out they are all under the control of Ulto Zora. Even the sword-wielding hunters end up being hit. From the people on the ground, red lines of energy begin to rise to the sphere of the Borgias dragon, which has already started to regenerate its body. Through a vision beyond reach, the progenitor observes the entire massacre with a sad face. She remembers Borgias' request to feed on these humans and that about 500,000 would be enough, but all of this would be so he can give his own life for the progenitor. Besides, Nebulon would take on the role of commanding the beasts, a good opportunity for him to gain experience. Anyway, the ancient dragon knows he won't live for much longer, so this is a chance to use the remainder of his life for the monarch. Moreover, after surviving the madness of the ancient monarch and the destruction of the lineage, Borgius lived only with the desire to see the lineage restored, and this wish was fulfilled by the progenitor. With this, Woltekemui appears totally insensitive and says to let the old man do whatever he wants. He even supports this line of thinking. Back in the present, at the base, the sun is already setting and the Silver Brigade is gearing up for the arrival of the enemies. With a few words from Ulto Zora, tentacles emerge from the ground and the princess realizes that the barriers she had placed in the earth have been broken. Despite it being a massive attack, she believes the base can withstand it. However, at that moment in the sky, Terra Tectra appears in its dragon form. It begins to descend, and Starlia is on the verge of despair, but she remembers a tip from Crimson to counter this attack. The impact causes minimal damage, while Ulta was certain it would explode the cliff. Through mental communication, Terra Tectra states that it was neutralized just before the collision. We see Ragna standing at the edge of the fissure formed by the collision, and it's revealed that it was the swords emitting the silverine that halted the attack. They still don't know that this is the Reaper they fear so much, so Ulta refrains from calling Kamui. Terra Tectra asks for the warrior's name, and internally, the warrior reflects on being terrible at talking to people but hating to speak with dragons. Thus, the response is silence. With that, Terra Tectra decides to communicate through violence. In the base, Ike, the guy with glasses, waits for the arrival of the enemies along with the rest of the Silver Brigade behind the bright protective barrier. Instead of dragons coming out of the hole in the wall, humans with zombie-like appearances enter. They explain that they were brought to serve as food for the dragons but managed to escape. The people request shelter and plead with the soldiers not to shoot as they continue to approach. It's at this moment that Ike recalls Crimson talking about Ulto Zora's chemical synthesis power enabling the hypnosis of victims. He tells the others not to lower their weapons, but now the zombies are too close for long-range combat, leaving only close-quarters combat. Nevertheless, the brigade manages to defend well against the zombified foes. Ike is no exception but hesitates when a child zombie appears to attack him. Luckily, Princess Steria shows no mercy and takes out all the advancing invaders. She takes the opportunity to say that they can only save the lives of the civilians they are defending and the soldiers beside each of them. Anyone beyond those mentioned must be eliminated without mercy, or she will have to do it herself. The speech works and the soldiers start attacking fiercely. Steria leaves Ike in charge of the base while she calls the twins, Chris and Tudor Nazarena, to join her in attacking the forest. In the distance, Ulto Zora is impressed with the princess's actions, but he comments that everything is going as planned. He intends to give a lesson on the battlefield, but the lessons will cost the princess her life. Meanwhile, we learn more about the superior dragons, also known as mature lineage members. Talent is usually measured by the maturation time, with faster maturation indicating greater power. The average is 10 to 15 years, and the quickest ones are ready in just one year, while Terra Tectra, for example, took 20 years. During the fight against Ragna, we discover that he doesn't have much talent as a lineage member, but he accumulated significant power during his time as a human. Using Silverine-infused swords, Ragna lands several attacks on the enemy. After damaging the armor a bit, the blades get stuck in a crack in Terra Tectra's shoulder. A superior dragon then uses its own flaming blood to counterattack. Ragna acknowledges that the opponent is tough. He used all his power in the last strike, but couldn't cut off the dragon's arm. 
Terra Tectra praises the human strength, but Ragnar refuses the admiration. Descending near the enemy, he releases one of the swords and takes off the glove from his right hand, determined to defeat this opponent in the next attack. Regardless of what the dragon will do, the boy intends to crush its magic and win, but he needs a high amount of silverine to do so. The problem is that his silverine battle art is dormant in his body for now, so he needs to create another power source outside his body, becoming one with the sword. The blade starts emanating an immense aura of power. Understanding the human's action, Terra Tectra prepares to use all its strength as well, intending to see which attack will prove superior in the showdown. Ragna then uses the Dragon Slayer attack, Flash of the Hunt, while the opponent uses the Seismic Cannon. The blows collide, causing an absurd shockwave. While this battle is taking place, Steria is using her power strategically, delegating power to others for greater utility. We see the arm team flying with silver pieces, as if they were the Silver Surfer. Ultra Zora is impressed with the aerial units. The twins use their enhanced visions to provide information on the enemy's positions, seeing kilometers away even at night. The mines report about the horde of about a thousand dragons surrounding the base and confirm that the total number of enemies is around 10,000, as predicted earlier. Further away is a more destroyed area where Ragna and Terra Tectra are fighting. However, they can't find Ulto Zora. In any case, all this information is impressive not only for their far-reaching vision, but also for their ability to communicate directly with anyone at a distance, updating the entire team on the situation outside. They mention that there are more than 1,500 humans in the area and two hordes are approaching the east entrance, totaling 400, possibly waiting for the brigade's attack. But for the princess, that doesn't matter because that's exactly what she wants. Meanwhile, Ulto Zora uses distant eyes to see the human situation, discovering that the first sent horde has been annihilated. The situation is tense for the soldiers who had to face the Zomify humans, but Steriev just wants a chance to vent her anger. This is when the impact of the attacks between Terra Tectra and Ragnet occurs. Ulto Zora is worried, but the armored dragon says it's okay, declaring victory while we see Ragna fallen with Mr. Slime trying to wake him up. Regardless, it's astonishing that a human went head to head with Terra Tectra who says that despite still being able to fight, it won't be able to use magic for a while after using the seismic cannon. Ulto Zora asks if there was silverine emanating from the human's body, and Terra Tectra responds that if the opponent had such power, they would have used it. They conclude that this isn't the Reaper who tried to end the progenitor, but Terra Tectra emphasizes that this enemy may still be on the battlefield, so they shouldn't let their guard down. At Ulto Zora's suggestion, he tries to take the opportunity to finish the guy off at once by stepping on him with his giant foot, but Ragna escapes at the last moment, surprising the dragons by still being alive. It turns out he survived by transferring the consciousness of his body from the human part to the sword part, so the battle is not over. Some lower dragons appear, whom the boy defeats in an instant. Terra Tectra says he's not as big of a threat now, and with a sufficient number of smaller enemies, he will be overcome and eliminated at some point. Before the superior dragon departs, Ragna, facing the inferior ones, asks him to wait and questions if they won't converse anymore through their fighting prowess. The big guy then says they've talked enough for him to understand that the kid is stronger than him. Well, he would be if the sword could withstand the power of his technique. Terra Tectra bids farewell, calling Ragna the man with no name, while receiving new instructions from comrade Ulto Zora, directing him to the princess's location. Ragna hasn't given up and starts cutting through the inferior dragons, trying to make his way to the superior dragon. The problem is, he's exhausted and heavily wounded, eventually dropping to his knees as hordes of inferior dragons keep increasing. Until Shin appears and saves the guy by eliminating the creatures. Next, the soldier pulls Ragna by the collar and questions why he's on his knees. Garm also appears, prompting Ragna to ask why they are in the midst of enemies when they should be defending the base. However, the conversation is interrupted by a dragon attack. The warriors face off against some of these monsters. Now they continue fighting while the old man explains that they haven't abandoned the base. Most entrances have been blocked, so the only way for the enemy now is the north entrance, where Ike's team is, while the princess fights alongside 200 soldiers. Shin states that, considering all this, he and Garm came to help Ragna, but the guy insists he doesn't need them and tells them to leave. They continue facing the creatures while Shin calls Ragna stupid for refusing help, but the guy just doesn't want people to keep going from the base in his place. Before finishing his response, the young man slips and falls from the back of the frozen dragon. Shin uses a powerful skill to get rid of several dragons around and approach Ragna. The discussion continues with Ragna insisting on doing everything alone and confirming to Shin that he wants them to hide while he takes care of things. So the Silver Brigade soldier takes a few steps back and says that in the last two days, he challenged Ragna 69 times and lost every fight, so now it's time for challenge number 70. 
He recalls a statement from the princess a few days before Raima's arrival. She talked about relocating civilians out of the country and avoiding confrontation with superior dragons at all costs. Shin protested because he didn't want to flee the fight, stating he would eliminate as many dragons as possible because he wasn't afraid of losing his life in battle. However, Steria asked how many dragons he would defeat. He wasn't sure, but it would be as many as he could. With that, she asked if he could take down a superior dragon. This left him astonished and she continued, saying that no matter how many weak dragons he defeated, it wouldn't make a difference. What she needed was to deal with the superior dragons. If she could, she would barbecue those creatures. Ending with a punch, stating that he talks too big for a short guy. She had mentioned he's still in the growth phase, so she said he could prove that if he survives this situation. The princess then addressed everyone, saying that after the escape, she would join the Solarians using their power to end the winged lineage and would need those soldiers by her side when the day came, asking them to follow her in this plan. Still in flashback mode, half a day passes and everyone thinks about what the princess said. Shin talks to a soldier named Yuga Robles, who says he has family in Donapieru, the first city attacked by dragons. It might be too late, but he has to go back there, so Yugo says that Shin must become the new master swordsman, even though the boy hasn't said if he'll stay or not. Yugo says that if he wants to become stronger, he needs to survive. With that, 120 of the 470 force members decided to stay in the country. In the present, while fighting with Ragna, Shin wonders if they are still alive and if they managed to protect something. He can't know, and in fact, it doesn't matter because he chose to escape. When a short guy finally surrenders to Ragna, the score changes to 69 to 1, marking his first victory. Then he pulls the guy by the hair to say that this is their battle, between those who chose to flee to survive and the dragons wanting to exterminate them. No matter how strong this guy is or the reason he fights, he can't just show up later and act like a big hero. Ending the conversation, the old man has already cleared the area around them. He starts boasting about wanting to get stronger, but Mr. Slime draws their attention not to lose focus because the eruption dragon escaped and they need to go after it. So they walk away, with Shin planning to hunt and eliminate the fifth seat of the lineage. Meanwhile, the princess creates a cage of magic barriers, questioning if Ulto Zora thought he would have an advantage in the forest where she can simply turn the forest into her territory. The twin is warned that the ground dragons have retreated and no aerial shooter was lost. On the ground, damages were minimal, and the soldiers remain willing to fight. With this small victory, the magic circle is doing well, mainly because they added a vertical dimension to level everything. For the princess, the biggest advantage is that they don't need to win, just survive to gather enough energy from the defeated dragons to use in the teleportation magic. The problem is that Ulto Zora has analyzed the princess well, both her extraordinary actions in this battle and what has been recorded about her. The dragon knows that she wouldn't risk the citizens' lives in a senseless battle, so he has figured out her intention, which is to use the magic absorption circle to take the energy from the eliminated dragons and use it for teleportation magic. Ulto Zora knows this because when he was part of the Solarians, they were studying how to use dragon energy in combat, and now he's seen the studies being successfully implemented. In short, he knows exactly the human's plan. Princess Daria possesses an incredible ocular ability. It's not any by Akugen, but she can perceive the aura emitted by all of creation. Dragons, however, lack this aura, but that doesn't mean Steria can't recognize these creatures. She perceives them as dark masses, contrasting with the natural brilliance of the world. Thus, she can identify the dragons. The problem is that the forest she's in has become draconic and everything around has turned completely dark. In this place, the princess can't perceive the movement of the dragons. As a result, the movement of people under Ulto Zora's control made her realize something was wrong. Steria notices a strange pattern in the movement of zombies and quickly understands that it's not random. The superior dragon already knows that only humans can be teleported within the magical circle's area, at least that's how he interpreted it. So the strategy is to have the zombified humans fill that area to increase the magic needed for teleportation since, in a way, they are still human. Thus, the princess's strategy is compromised for now. Despite these adversities, the princess prefers not to act clueless and remains resolute. An unnoticed dragon attempts a fire attack, but Steria uses a magical barrier to protect herself and her followers. Nevertheless, the power is impressive because it comes from a dragon that has lived long enough to become experienced. These inferior and median dragons can learn some of the spells of the mature dragons that created them. The princess asks if the Smekbers can aim from above, but the aerial support is occupied with several small tornadoes created by other dragons. To Ulto Zora, mature dragons are the perfect pawns of the lineage as dozens of elite hunters would need to unite to defeat just one of them, and at the moment, they have about 40. The superior dragon feels quite content with this situation. The advantage is clear. When Steria tries to attack a nearby enemy dragon, another smaller one uses a barrier spell to stop the attack. 
This protected barrier doesn't allow anything from outside to pass through, but it allows anything from inside to pass out without any problem. Meanwhile, Ultazora calculates that the magic absorption area of the circle is 2 kilometers, something that surpasses the magical capabilities a country like this could normally create on its own. Therefore, it's clear that there is something more behind all of this. The superior dragon recalls Nebula mentioning not seeing the face, but there was a woman with white hair and a black dress who used a magic perhaps more powerful than his own barrier magic. Despite being in the advantage, Ultazora is not counting on victory yet because several things have happened beyond expectations, and the tide can turn in an instant depending on what might happen next. After all, even if the battle is won, it would be a defeat for them if the princess escapes. There's the possibility of her realizing that there's no chance of victory and abandoning the civilians, activating the teleportation magic. For a definitive victory, they need to take control of the magical circle at the base. Meanwhile, Ike faces a complicated moment while defending the base. He realizes that all the soldiers on the front line were suddenly eliminated. He didn't even see how it happened despite keeping an eye on them the whole time. The current enemy is a white dragon with purple eyes, which, when opened, makes all magical defense grids disappear. The creature approaches, while Ike can only try to decipher what's happening. Regardless, knowing that even though small, this must be a mature dragon, Ike orders the men to fall back to the second line of defense and requests support from the marksman. Only now does he remember a warning from Crimson about the monarch ultimation being able to control time, and that mature dragons would surely replicate this ability in this battle. That's exactly what's happening, and the creature not only stops time but also releases powerful energy bursts, wiping out several soldiers at once and knocking Ike to the ground. Not sure of what's happening, Ike doesn't know how to deal with this type of enemy, but remembers that the princess left him in charge of the base, so he starts going on the offensive, imagining that the dragon's power has a time limit. Otherwise, he would have been eliminated already. He also thinks that the creature needs some time before using the power again, so time to attack is now before the creature can stop time again. After a leap, Ike uses the sword to defend against some energy bursts and almost lands a precise blow, but the dragon manages to dodge, leaving only a silver mark on its shoulder. Before the monster stops time again, Crimson confuses it, appearing out of nowhere and making the creature think he is the monarch. The mage throws a spherical grenade in the air and still confused, the dragon decides to stop time. But this turns out to be its worst mistake since as soon as time stops, the magical grenade activates, emitting a good amount of sunlight, burning the dragon completely. With the creature eliminated, time starts passing again, while Ike and the others are confused and somewhat blinded too. Crimson explains the magical grenade, which is a weapon that emits accumulated sunlight, but this one was modified to explode automatically when it detected that time had stopped. And that's precisely what makes it so effective because with time stopped, the dragon continues to be burned by the sunlight as a normal grenade would just explode and end the effect immediately. The agony prevents the creatures from thinking straight, and they end up not being able to process what's happening. Crimson then mentions that to defeat an enemy that stops time is necessary to turn the static world into an unbearable hell. At least that's the simplest way. At this moment, Ike notices other people on the scene, who are the 1500 citizens who were under the brigade's protection. They told Crimson that they didn't want to stand still while the soldiers fought alone, so the mage felt touched and equipped them with weapons. But of course, with this redhead, there's always something behind it. These people are hypnotized and Crimson does the same with Ike and the other soldiers so that they think everything is fine, because the mage already knows that Ulto Zora has figured out the teleportation plan and placed the zombies in the circle area to double the amount of magic needed. Therefore, for Crimson, the best way out is to have the hypnotized face the zombify to reduce the number of humans in the effect area. Meanwhile, the 13th member of the lineage Urshkorun is tearing down walls in an attempt to bypass the barriers on the way to the base. However, he can't succeed, so he starts shouting in frustration. Unluckily for him, the noise bothers Fu, who is dealing with stress due to insomnia. Fu prepares to launch an attack while recalling the conversation with the princess about needing nearly 18,000 lesser dragons to activate the magic. The number is concerning, but the guy explains that defeating medium or mature dragons would bring dozens or even hundreds of times more magical power to the circle. Finally, he informs that he will take a nap when the fight begins. Having said that, in the present, Fu defeats Urshkorun in the blink of an eye, using the power of his right arm, and absorbs all the dragon's magical energy. He feels satisfied for having taken down this enemy before losing control. The problem is that Majorica and the others start beating him up to regain consciousness, claiming that he had lost control of his arm. Apparently, it was just Majorica's plan to get rid of her colleague and take his place in the hierarchy. Meanwhile, Crimson is impressed with Fu's power and gains significant interest in the brigade, wanting to take control of them with minimal damage. 
At this moment, the Roots break down a few more walls and civilians defend themselves with the weapons provided by Crimson. Few is confused by the presence of civilians and the weapons, but Crimson is more concerned about the pressure from the forest that is beginning to overcome the princess's barriers. They need to strengthen the magical circle's defenses or it will be the end for humans. In the forest, the battle continues intensely. The twins face the wind powers of the dragons and some of the shooters are knocked down. Meanwhile, down below, the little dragon who created the barrier is quite happy with the situation. However, the shield is soon broken from above, and the creature begins to worry until being heavily struck by a warrior. At this moment, Ulta Zora realizes there was a miscalculation. He didn't anticipate that the princess would dispatch her troops to break the shield with their own strength instead of continuing to shoot from a distance. Thus, he concludes that the more insane the commander, the more insane his men. In the meantime, a warrior informs Steria that they have taken care of the fire-spinning dragon, but the other one, the thorns, is not around. She suggests he is probably on the cliff. She is ready to dispatch the troops again when the wind dragons start attacking from above after overcoming the brigade's air force. Ulta Zora considers it normal for the princess to remain at a disadvantage due to her lack of experience in large-scale battles. In this case, she commanded the defense and attack with an overwhelming disadvantage without realizing how it could quickly exhaust her. Thus, it is proven that being able to do anything one focuses on can have its disadvantages. The superior dragon, despite enjoying himself, considers the party over. However, Teratectra warns about something about 300 meters behind him. Checking for himself, Ulta Zora sees Ragna and the others advancing fiercely, while Teratectra reports losing a third of the platoon. Of course, if they continue pressing for numerical advantage, they will eventually win, but the number needed to do so is larger than expected. Meanwhile, the guys keep advancing with no time to catch their breath. Garm acknowledges that they can't even get close to Terra Tectra due to the overwhelming number of enemies in the way. However, despite the circumstances, Ragman won't give up. He continues advancing with determination. Shin simply can't understand how the guy remains firm even in these conditions, almost crawling, but this serves as motivation for him to continue as well. Inside, Ragna is suffering a lot. He can't breathe, feels pain, cold, and the urge to stop, but he knows he can't give up now. He needs to hunt Terra Tectra, Ulto Zora, and the horde of dragons to collect the magic. He wants to protect everyone on his own, so no one else has to lose their life. At this moment, he remembers what Shin said earlier about him, not being able to just show up at the end and act like the big hero. Those words hit Ragna like a punch in the stomach. Anyway, he felt somewhat relieved to hear that, but future Ragna considers it a weakness because he always survived, always was the only one to remain alive. So he thinks he can only stay with people whose deaths won't hurt him or who won't die either. When the three stop in front of another group of dragons, Ragnar resumes fighting impressively, taking down all the creatures alone. As always, this surprises the other two as even with one foot in the grave, he continues with insanely effective techniques. At this moment, Ulto Zora realizes he made a miscalculation, but that's something that can happen on the battlefield from time to time, persistence. On the other hand, Ragnar feels something strange, a sense of despair as defeat seems certain. This is common for future Ragna. And at this moment, more than ever, Ragna feels the proximity of his future self, and to him, that is like returning to hell. Ragna has already learned that the aura flowing through everything in this world does not flow dragons. Instead of this aura, they possess magical power, something beyond that alters this world, and that's why Silverine exists. The world created this power to resist the transformative powers of magic. While Ragna reflects, enemies approach. With half a second left before the nearest target reaches him, he uses this time to refine Silverine's freezing ability. Ragna then advances to launch the attack, knowing that he only needs one sword movement to defeat his prey. He also understands that Silverine's battle art is not the only thing that made the future Ragna so powerful. There's also what he learned from experience, the ability to survive a battle. Imagination is essential. It's hard to accept that all this happened in just half a second, but let's assume the guy has an ultra-fast thought process. Next, Ragna moves the sword forward, and from the blade's tip emanates a large amount of silverine freezing and eliminating all advancing dragons at once. He does all this with the thought that he only needs to mentally visualize the attack's result for everything to happen. And thus he remembers, while facing another group of dragons, that for him, moving the sword is like conjuring the image of a dragon-free future and bringing it into reality. Meanwhile, Teratectra also has his reflections. He knows that when enemies become persistent, they also become more resistant, spreading to others around. Ult of Zora agrees but says it doesn't matter how much they endure because the princess is already on her last legs as we can see. The poor thing needs protection because of her injuries. Steria decides to head northwest, so the blonde soldier picks her up and carries her on his shoulder. 
Besides knowing the princess's condition, Ulto Zora reveals that he sent Platinum Tyra to attack the base, the one that stopped time, but he can no longer communicate telepathically with her, and Terra Tektra is also not hearing anything from Ursh Goron anymore. Ulta Zora wonders if they were defeated while receiving information about the air squadrons being shot down as well. The most impressive thing for him is the base defeating the 13th seat and an elite mature dragon so quickly. Confirming that there are 5 minutes left for Terra Tektra's magic to recharge, Ulta Zora determines that this is the time the brigade still has to survive. He says he will deal with the soldiers outside and the ones who brought down the air squadron and asks his colleague to notify when he's ready. Terra Tektra asks if the companion is really aware of this situation because normally he wouldn't need his help to have a complete picture of the battlefield. And he may be rushing things. Anyway, the big guy's concern is for the princess and her men, so Ulta Zora reassures him, saying he will handle her. Meanwhile, Ragna makes a small mistake and sees that the last attack's effect was very different from what he imagined, so he needs to adjust the attack's form. The problem is that Shin suddenly appears and finishes off this dragon. Ragna is confused until Shin mourns that he's helping. Out of nowhere, Ragna says the short guy is right, remembering that he told him not to act like a hero and he was right about that too. He concludes that he shouldn't stop anyone who wants to hunt dragons and then apologizes, saying that Shin can fight as much as he wants while he will protect him as much as he wants. This still sounds a bit off the short guy, but Ragna says that fighting together means covering each other's weaknesses. So he moves forward and the others follow him. Ragna is internally fighting to overcome hell because, for him, the more he experiences desperate situations like his future self went through, the more he adapts to it. Therefore, he wants to overcome this hell to gain the power he has in the future. Shin, on the other hand, doesn't like Ragna's abyssal power, nor that he hid it until the final minutes, but what he likes the least is getting excited like a child with any sign of approval from him. Meanwhile, Garm already interprets that Ragna did not have a power growth, it's more like the dormant instincts of a formidable warrior are gradually being recovered. As he suspected before, this guy's powers were refined for a long time, and what can be taken from it is to observe and fight together to absorb and learn what is missing for his technique. In the midst of this battle, Mr. Slime remembers that Crimson only said to keep an eye on the idiotic human, so it should be a problem to eat dragons in the meantime. Everyone's excitement contrasts with the previous moments when everyone was hopeless. At this point, Ulta Zora decides to use more mature dragons. The first of the Tembroobtaf species has magic that affects the environment to use it to its advantage. It causes refraction in light and nullifies sounds and scents, in addition to generating force fields in the nearby air to step without leaving footprints and reducing gravity and air resistance for mobility. Basically, the creature becomes invisible and super fast, in addition to pulling prey with gravitational force. However, Ragna has no difficulty in finishing the creature when it's about to be devoured. Then he finishes off three more dragons of the same type. Holding the fifth, Shin asks why he doesn't leave some enemies for them, but Ragna only thinks about hunting all the dragons. At the same time, the short guy notices that Mr. Slime is growing. Now, Ulto Zora is almost entering despair because none of this makes sense. Not only did Ragna easily retaliate against those mature dragons, but it was like a technique he had already learned, so he is not only very strong. Meanwhile, civilians are facing zombified humans with firearms, which is also strange to Ulto Zora, not only because they are civilians, but because of the strange weapons he does not recognize, at least with the civilians' actions and expressions he concludes that they have been brainwashed. This is very cruel and unusual, something the princess would not do, so there must be another person giving orders. The way of acting is similar to what happened in the capital when they used the best way to face Ultimatia, sacrificing civilians. Meanwhile, Crimson is taking control of the magic circle. After brainwashing civilians and seeing the amount of magical energy that Fu applied to the circle, the redhead brainwashes the other mages and hits Fu's arm to continue with his plan. Irritated by the way everyone blindly obeys, Fu asks what was done to them. Crimson scoffs, claiming he only turned everyone into friends while the guy recalls the princess talking about the large mass of death she saw in the redhead. The guy feels the princess was right. Understanding what's going on in the guy's mind, Crimson begins talking about good and evil, stating that the princess is a very logical person who quickly grasped the situation. She knew that no matter what she said, if the decision was to discard the civilians and flee only with the soldiers, most of the troops wouldn't follow her. Even if it decreases the chance of survival, soldiers need a purpose, which in this case would be to protect the 1500 citizens. Crimson continues saying that now, with most of the army under control and chaos outside, they no longer need such a purpose. To explain the reasoning, he says that wickedness would be sacrificing valuable people for the sake of useless people, which is exactly what's happening. Therefore, good would be the opposite of that. 
The redhead concludes that the citizens understand their own survival is bleak and chose to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Fu strongly opposes brainwashing and magical hypnosis, finding these actions terrible. Crimson being a mage tells Fu that he doesn't need a purpose like soldiers and warriors do. He even apologizes for the arm as it was a precaution against the guy's surprising power. With the help of others, Crimson has already taken measures to transport only the troops, with a third of the gathered magic being sufficient. Now it's just necessary to activate it, but only Fu can do that. Crimson expresses a desire to befriend Fu for this reason. Meanwhile, Ulta Azora is certain that the person who blew up the capital is the same one manipulating the citizens. It remains to determine who the Reaper is. For him, there's a high probability it's Ragna. The superior dragon even considers calling Kamui. But, as Crimson predicted, he can't do that because the Reaper's power is too close to Kemui's, risking the possibility of the progenitor being taken to another dimension to be eliminated. It's precisely because Crimson knows Ulta Zora considers these details that he calculated his moves based on the fact that he wouldn't make inconsistent decisions. In the meantime, chaos is unfolding outside. Greya, one of the twins, is dealing with aerial combat when she's caught off guard. On the ground, soldiers continue advancing fiercely, even trying to calculate the enemy ratio. With Greya down, some dragons try to attack, but she fights back fiercely, even feeding on the dragon's flesh. Her sister, Hesula, also appears, and after recovering, they prepare to return to the battle. Back at the base, Crimson is flirting with Fu and talks about gender, stating that whatever he thinks is right. Crimson enjoys appearing so androgynous to be loved by everyone since people are capable of killing for love or even sacrificing themselves for those they love. While Crimson talks about wanting people to love him, especially Fu, who has powerful absorption magic in his body, the guide gradually loses consciousness and almost enters a trance. Crimson was about to tell him to activate the circle when Majorica interrupts going against orders and calling Fu her brother. Crimson comments that they don't look like siblings while Majorica is stopped by one of the hypnotized civilians who accidentally shoots at point-blank range. Fu tries to take advantage of an opening to retaliate, but Crimson quickly immobilizes him again. Now frustrated for losing the hypnosis link, Crimson tries a more aggressive approach, saying that he will eliminate one of the thaumaturges every 10 seconds, starting with the least talented. He begins the countdown, and the woman panics, thinking something is wrong because they drew the circle together and got along well. However, the countdown doesn't stop, so Fu surrenders, saying he will obey. At this moment, a bright light shines in the hall, Majorica undergoes a transformation with light hair and eyes. Crimson orders an attack, but the shots stop before reaching her. She declares her hatred for the redhead and orders him to leave. As she says this, Crimson and the civilians disappear, and Majorica falls unconscious. Now out of the trance, the other thaumaturges are desperate, apologizing and stating they didn't see the truth. They pledge not to trust anyone blindly from now on. The question now is what happened to Crimson and Fu imagines that he was teleported, but has no idea where. Far away, Crimson finds himself falling from incredible height, understanding that he was teleported by Majorica. Just as absorption magic resides in Fu's body, teleportation magic resides in hers. Despite everything, Crimson finds it amazing because the brigade is truly full of talented people. The problem is that Crimson became too greedy with these things. Ulta Zora continues calculating the possibilities considering Walt Camus' absurd speed. He could leave the capital and reach the battlefield within two seconds. However, the telepathic communication of his lineage has a distance limitation, meaning he would need several medium-sized dragons to send any message to the capital, creating a kind of game of telephone. That would take at least 40 seconds to accomplish. Nevertheless, he has no intention of summoning Camus for this battle. Ulta Zora begins to wonder what the Reaper and the other person want with all of this. What is their motive for aiding the Silver Brigade? Besides luring Kamui into a trap, he believes there are two other reasons for their involvement. They might be trying to help the princess escape to find the will of the progenitor goddess. Or perhaps the Lumidic from the capital failed to use spatial magic for some reason and decided to join the princess to flee the country. But maybe the guy is just pretending he can't use magic to influence him to call Kamui, enabling them to return to the capital. Despite all these possibilities, the fact remains that the enemy seems to be abandoning civilians to expedit the teleportation. So it's a race between them teleporting and the dragons eliminating the princess first. Therefore, the priority now is to finish off Steria. Meanwhile, Crimson is all battered up after the fall. He hopes the teleportation will be carried out soon, preferably with talented soldiers. Moreover, for Crimson, it's even better if the princess is eliminated in this battle unless he can control her with Ragma's presence, these are Crimson's thoughts before losing consciousness. On the battlefield, some soldiers start performing well on the ground until they're hit by the dragon's wind from above, combined with the fire breath from the ground. 
It's at this moment that the blonde guy appears, carrying the princess and hurling an axe that hits three dragons at once. To motivate the troops, he delivers a speech, saying that was his best throw, and that he only managed to break a personal record while running in this situation because he got stronger during this battle. The man's logic is that every step they take exhausts them, but also every step taken and every dragon hunted makes them stronger. And that strength means they can take another step forward and hunt another dragon, meaning they can keep moving and get anywhere. The other soldiers comment that the guy is taking this no pain, no gain talk too seriously, but still, they agree that what's still helping them move forward is their willpower. Meanwhile, the twins are taking down several dragons in succession, and the princess notices this, pleased with her followers' efforts. The girl also remembers when she asked Crimson for help locating Ulto Zora despite it being a dangerous move. The mage helped identify the area where the superior dragon could be, saying he would be within a mile of the base, still on the border side. One piece of information that helps to be more precise is the battle between Terra Tectra and Ragna, as the dragon must see the guy as a threat and would probably drive the battle to gain distance from Ulto Zora. With that, the princess already has an idea of the enemy's direction. Moreover, there's also the fact that he can use blood to spread small vision organs to monitor the combat area and under those circumstances, Crimson calculated that he could see about two miles away with this ability. With this information, the princess sharpens her senses in the direction and approximate distance to find Ulto Zora, but it's at this moment that he drives the dragons of this region crazy, or rather crazier, because according to him, the beasts were at 80% madness, and now they're at 200. This makes them much fiercer, easily dispatching soldiers, but it will also cause the creatures to disintegrate in a few minutes. Even in this situation, the princess doesn't give up and advances with the soldiers, jumping high to get closer to reaching Ulto Zora. After the jump, they'll still have to run a bit, but they'll be almost close enough for direct attack. Realizing that the princess has located him, Ulto Zora wonders if the other strategist won't make any moves, in this case, Crimson, but we know he's not in condition at the moment. Therefore, he releases a purple toxin, imagining that the opponent is preparing a big maneuver, but he finds it too obvious. In a brief moment, the superior dragon catches a glimpse of Lakusha, so Nazarian appears out of nowhere and takes advantage to launch a surprise attack while he's off guard. With the head kicked far away, the body speaks alone to the woman, congratulating her for getting so far without being noticed by his surveillance. Another mouth on the hand starts arguing with the body's mouth, while Nazarian tries to understand if this is a false body, then she hit both the brain and the heart. Anyway, with her part done, she starts to move away to leave the rest of the princess. And speaking of her, the girl congratulates the tutor's work because it saved her from using her most powerful technique in the wrong place. Turns out, the body on the ground was indeed fake. Ulto Zora is actually a hundred meters underground. With this, she starts manipulating the earth to force the dragon upwards, trying to bring him to the surface, shining brightly as she struggles to make this move. Then she commands Chris's throw. At this moment, more crazy dragons appear, so the other soldiers prepare to defend the princess. As he rises, Ulto Zora thinks about his memories lacking color and how he can't recall certain emotions from that day with Lakusha, but now it's a bit different. Remembering part of the conversation, his memories are clearer now. This is because he saw Princess Silverware, who made him see how she sparkles with a bright light. The dragon also thinks about the danger, knowing he should eliminate the girl as soon as possible, but still, as he's about to see that glow even closer and probably gain a bit more color to his memories, he starts to hesitate. However, it's at this moment that Terra Tectra communicates again with his comrade, stating that the forest is compromised, the magic level is rising rapidly, and Ulto Zora must not let the dragons enter the forest. Suddenly, everything starts to tremble. The dragon-headed roots on the ground begin to attack everyone around, both dragons and humans. Ulto Zora can no longer control it and wonders if it's a scheme of the opposing strategist. However, as the heads are attacking the brigade, what must be happening is that the dragon Borgias is recovering its primary power. On one hand, Ulto Zora is angry about this, but he also imagines it could be a good thing, considering something strange was happening to him when he was being dragged upwards. He was about to do something crazy. At this moment, Ragna and the others appear, barely able to speak due to exhaustion, but determined to continue fighting, as if they still had all the energy in the world, because all three of them want to become the strongest. Meanwhile, Terra Tector prepares to use the cannon, aiming directly at the trio. He fires six shots in a row, causing massive explosions at the same point. It was a direct hit, but he cannot confirm if he managed to exterminate the targets because the smoke and flames are blocking his view. The big guy notices that the forest seems a bit calmer and asks how things are. Ulto Zora then analyzes from various angles and ends up finding the fallen princess but lies to Terra Tectra, saying he didn't find her, but thinks she might not have survived, perhaps buried in the midst of all the confusion. 
Terra Tectra suggests making area shots to ensure casualties, but Ulta Zora tells him to focus on the guy who could be the Reaper. Not knowing why he's lying to his comrade, Ulta Zora also says that luckily, most of the Horde has left the forest, and they will quickly find the body considering the numbers. Then he forms the body near the fallen princess and begins to recall that from the beginning, he knew something was wrong. He was amazed that she was brilliant, disappointed that she was inexperienced, and excited to go to war for the first time in a long while. Even after realizing that the other strategist's garbage was lurking here in the shadows, Ulta Zora continued to focus on the princess. Now he questions if that was truly an impartial decision. He approaches the girl and recalls his past. He lived a life bathed in brilliance and wasn't like he is today. He had subordinates, companions, and the one for whom he would give everything, his sovereign lady. Everything shown in those times until the era of glory came to an end, and he was transformed into what he is now. However, everything he lost on that day is right in front of him at this very moment. Still facing her, Ulto Zora says it was a pleasure to have met the Silver Princess, Steria Lys, and that it was a splendid battle. He also sincerely respects the brave efforts of her and her troops. Now there's a flashback on the other side, with Crimson telling Princess Staria, accompanied by Ike and Nazarena, about Princess Lakusha, a heroic woman who enchanted many warriors with her innate abilities and charisma. She had many military achievements with her leadership, and even the Solarianos came to consider her a miracle of God becoming a dragon scourge. Upon hearing this, Steria says that even children know everything about her and always thought Lakusha was an imitation of her. Crimson then says that nevertheless, the world believes that Steria is the reincarnation of Princess Lakusha. Next, Crimson comments on the changes that occurred with Ulto Zora, that not even under the Bloodline's blood oath could he serve the enemy in his original form. Finally, the redhead asks her not to give up the fight because her and the Truth's Way will act like a slow-acting poison on Ulto Zora and drive him mad. Back in the present in the forest, the guy decides to make the princess part of the lineage. At this moment, she wakes up and realizes she's close to victory. Ulto Zora says her brilliance should not leave this world, so he will make the request to the monarch. Somehow, the superior dragon thinks this will solve not only their problems, but also the princess's troops. Still on the ground, she asks him if he knows why she shines so brightly. She answers that this world created the Silverine to be the desire of resistance. Therefore, the control she has over the Silverine means her splendor is the will of the world itself. Staria also says she wasn't a match for Ulto Zora as a general or a warrior. But that doesn't matter because if there's an area where she surpasses him, it's this magic inundated realm where the princess has a high desire for resistance, and she can shape it. Now more imposing, while summoning a giant silver weapon, the girl says her talent as a warrior or general isn't what makes her most proud, but the ability to forge silver weapons. She then strikes the weapon into Ulto Zora's chest, pinning him against a tree and freezing him and everything around. Even while frozen, the dragon can still speak and begins to say that the princess is delirious, perhaps from the toxin he released earlier. At this moment, two soldiers appear to take her away. After they move away, Chris approaches and pulls the weapon, saying they haven't lost yet. Steria communicates with the rest of the troops to motivate them to keep going while continuing to share her power, especially with Chris, who concentrates everything on the spear and aims it at Terra Tectra, under the princess's command. Realizing this, Ulto Zora warns his comrade, who in reaction, uses the cannon to confront the weapon, creating a massive explosion and generating a huge amount of silver. Through the vast sphere of silver and smoke that emerged from the explosion, Chris's throne spear pierces through, demonstrating everyone's determination not to give up easily. Ult of Zora emerges from the ground in a monstrous form attempting to attack the princess, who is saved by Nazara. It's at this moment that the weapon hits Terra Tectra, piercing through him, but Ragna comes running right behind. Shin realizes he's trapped in a bubble and isn't sure what happened to him to end up standing there while Ragna continues advancing. The guy is frustrated because he decided to escape that day, but even during the escape, he can't perform well. When Ragna grabs the spear, Terra Tectra prepares to use the cannon, but the hunter employs a powerful hunting flash that resembles a Kamehameha, overcoming the opponent at once. Ulto Zora is disbelieving while Ragna falls onto the slime who praises the guy's performance. However, Ragna is more concerned because what happened was that Terra Tectra exploded at the moment of the attack, so he needs to act quickly. Meanwhile, Ulto Zora is in despair for losing his partner. He starts shouting for a response from his comrade who replies. Ulto Zora is happy, but not for long as the big guy warns that he won't last much longer. He avoided going down instantly when he exploded upon impact, but now he's on his last legs, unable to regenerate from damage at this level. Terra Tectra mentions that he swore to fulfill his duty without dying, but now he feels so pathetic that he can't express the remorse he feels for his progenitor. Ulta Zora denies all of this, saying that the real blame is his for not lying to Terra Tectra, 
so the big guy is suffering the consequences of Ulto Zora's actions. However, the partner says that no one can judge his actions. What matters now is that they prevail. Terratector also states that it's not Ulto Zora's fault. He recalls loving Princess Lakushia like a warrior loves his lady, but Ulto Zora loved her as a man loves a woman. Despite everything, the big guy feels that he wasn't sincere enough in calling Ulto Zora a comrade, so he thinks these are the consequences of his lack of sincerity. Still, he can think of only one way for them to fulfill his mission, if Ulto Zora agrees. He doesn't know how to address the other if he can't call them comrade anymore, but still, Ulto Zora is the commander in this battle and must make the decision. With much agony, the dragon commander decides to send his partner to explode again, so that his sacrifice takes the enemies of the progenitor with him. Terratectra apologizes and bids farewell, while Ulto Zora moves away from the area. The big guy then concentrates all his power to cause a massive explosion, sweeping everything in its path. However, Ragna manages to arrive in time to stand between the explosion and the humans. He uses a continuous barrage of silverine to contain the explosion on his side, but the situation is not easy. In the distance, the soldiers notice the brightness of the explosion, and the princess reveals that Terratectra exploded and Ragna is holding the impact, warning that if he succumbs, this entire area will be devastated with no escape. The hunter resists bravely, while Mr. Slime also arrives to offer moral support. Ragnar realizes that he can't freeze this side of the explosion, but he can still gather more power. The problem is that the weapon is almost breaking. Observing from afar, the princess wonders if even Ragnar has enough power to suppress this impact. Despite being worried, she feels that Ragnar is keeping part of his power in reserve. When trying to understand why, she concludes that it's because of her sword, and she begins to limb it, realizing that this must be the worst day of her life. The princess is on the ground feeling completely defeated, recalling that when she decided to fight on the surface, she had 200 soldiers following her, and they were being eliminated one by one. Now only a few are still alive. All others sacrificed themselves following Steria's orders, while she continued to be entirely overwhelmed by affliction several times. At this moment, she stands up, knowing that she just wanted to keep crying, but despite all this, she's not the type to leave her fate in the hands of another person even if it's the man she loves. Now, much more determined, the princess says she will continue moving forward and will prevail. For this, she still asks for the support of the soldiers on site to take care of everything, while she projects her consciousness near Ragna. When the weapon is almost destroyed, the princess puts her hand on the sword with him and says she won't give up. Meanwhile, Nazarina and the others are protecting her static body from the dragons that still try to attack. Together, they don't give up, and Princess Steria tells him to use every fraction of his strength, the soldiers continue to fight bravely, including Chris with a sword in his mouth and Ike, now without glasses, shooting at the dragons. They encourage each other by exchanging insults, while the twins attack again from the air, Hesela using a firearm and Greya using her paralyzing scream. At the same time, the Arcanists continue working on the magic circle with full focus. The princess continues to use her ability to increase the strength of the sword, and Ragnar realizes that he's receiving the power from the princess's hand, while many people continue fighting, surviving, and dying just so that at this moment he receives the necessary support, the duo concentrates with full force and the Silverine finally begins to create a freezing barrier to hold the explosion. Unfortunately, the barrier breaks again. Princess Sturia realizes that the energy of the explosion is now concentrated entirely in their direction, showing that even at the end of his life, Terratectra still has much tenacity, enough to be a deadly challenge for the princess. Nevertheless, she knows that this was to be expected as the dragon sacrificed himself for this attack, so he needed to make his life count. Seeing the princess's distress, Ragna tells her not to worry because they won't lose after coming so far. The two let go of the weapon. The guy says that inside him exists a sword. He wants her to help him, and in return, he will repay with all the power he possesses. In a way, Steria ends up internally seeing Ragna looking towards the future. It's a vision in which the future Ragna is on top of a frozen dragon, holding the massive sword. Emotionally moved, the princess lets a tear fall. At this moment, Ragna uses his Silverine Battle Arts attack, while Princess Steria uses her ability to activate Aura and activate Silverine to shape the Silverine form. With all the power being unleashed, Ragna reflects on how hunting dragons on his own is great and failing at it means being weak, dependent on others. But that's what he always thought until now. This time, Ragna feels his heart burning with flames, he clenches his fist and punches the sword, releasing so much energy that even Ulto Zora, at a distance, is astonished. The other soldiers also notice the immense power released at the location. Then we see that Ragnar was able to use the freezing power to completely contain the explosion. The princess sees the future Ragnar again and continues, shedding tears. He asks why she's crying, but she denies it, saying she's just amazed. 
She has realized that he only has so much power because of the future Ragna, and finds it absurd for someone so handsome to end up alone without any reward and without fulfilling any of his desires. To her, this is unacceptable. Ragna pays attention to the girl and ends up thanking her for meeting his future self. In turn, the princess says she should thank him for the help that made this victory possible. She formally thanks him and praises his last blow, which to her was super cool. Then, she regrets it, totally embarrassed for losing her composure. Nevertheless, she decides to go ahead, asking Ragna to give up the crimson trash and join her from now on because she guarantees she won't let him have such a miserable future. The girl leaves the proposal hanging but also makes it clear that she won't accept a no as an answer. The princess's projection disappears and Ragna comments that she is an amazing person. Again, he thanks her for surviving with him because they ended up saving each other. Then he collapses on the ground. The soldiers are relieved when the princess returns to consciousness in her body. In the meantime, the magic circle is already ready, so Master Few activates the teleportation magic. Lord Slime takes the opportunity to tell Ragna that he only won with his help, so he owes him eternal gratitude. The conversation is cut off when the teleportation magic light makes Ragna's body glow. Now Slime is worried because his body isn't glowing too. Everyone is very happy and relieved that the plan is working, but to end everyone's joy, the princess is hit in the neck by a fatal blow from Wolf to Camus. Then he puts her head back in place and starts acting tough. Ragna is amazed by the situation, so Kamui attacks him, one your force of fight. He tells the opponent to fight seriously with everything he has unless he has used up all his energy and now has nothing left, which in that case for Wolf to Kamuni is pathetic. The dragon says this is the end of the line and Ragna must prepare for his last fight. Meanwhile, Nebula warns Ultimation that Kamui has left, and the progenitor confirms that he went to the battlefield and Nebula shouldn't worry. She reveals that she is terrified of this enemy, a simple memory makes her tremble, but everything will be fine because she can't imagine for a second that the idiot Wolt Kamui would lose to such a weak enemy. The battle already begins fiercely, while Ragna has a flashback of Crimson talking about the Monarch of the Claws lineage, which doesn't share blood. Instead, the Monarch teaches battle arts to followers, whether they are dragons or humans. Those who achieve satisfactory proficiency receive from the Monarch a demonic sword, one of the six claws and two fangs, totaling the eight most powerful demonic swords in the world. Those who have one of these swords are considered of the claw lineage. They are powerful warriors linked not by blood but by combat arts and swords. It turns out that one of them was eliminated and had the sword stolen by an outlaw, which was Kamui when he was still human. That said, Crimson thinks he shouldn't face him, the guy was already an anomaly even when he was human. So if he's not an enemy that can be defeated with strategy. The strategy should be to avoid fighting him. Finally, the mage mentions that if Ragna ends up fighting Kamui, it should be after eliminating Ultimatia. In the present, still facing Kamui, Ragna knows that Crimson explained the reason, but now we can't remember, that's just what was missing. They exchange some blows, but Wolt Kamui shows that he has the speed of lightning, hitting several attacks in succession. Then they compete in strength with a double headbutt. Ragna still releases a large amount of silvering on Kamui's face, but the dragon instantly retaliates by throwing him away and changing to a shadowy form. From above, he hits another electric attack, and after sinking into the ground, Ragna returns for more exchanging of blows. Wolt Kamui really seems to have the advantage until Ragna manages to block an attack and push the opponent away with an energy sphere. Then he concentrates silvering in his hand and pulls out another silver sword, but on the impact of the attacks, the sword breaks. Kamui now shows his own stolen sword, the Claw of Lightning Skyrend. After this last attack, Ragna falls to the ground and can no longer move. Kamui approaches, saying it wasn't even fun. The hunter does everything to move but can't until he hears the voice of Princess Steria calling him. When Ragna recognizes the princess and she confirms it's her, the guy starts shouting Silver Princess and touches her shoulders. He shouts like crazy while the girl begins to feel dizzy because of the sudden closeness of the man she likes. In reaction, she ends up executing a judo move to push the guy away. Besides complaining about the proximity, the princess says he should call her by the nickname Leah when addressing her directly. When Ragna obeys and calls her Laia, the girl sees him as a shining human sword and becomes even more enamored. Now that things have calmed down, the guy realizes they're in a completely destroyed place resembling a post-apocalyptic scenario. He asks where they are. The princess replies that it's the place they were teleported to. Ragna asks about the others, and she tells him to follow her. On the way, Saria asks what he thought of Garm and Shin's help. The guy responds that they saved him that both are very talented, and they became stronger during the battle. At one point, he ended up competing against them, able to unleash even more power from the future than usual. The princess is not surprised because they are the master swordsmen of the brigade. 
However, she also comments that Garm, not only because of age but also because of skill, thought he had reached his limit, but he ended up breaking that barrier when witnessing Ragnar's strength thus. All the experience accumulated over the years still enables him to achieve great feats. On the other hand, Shin is the most talented in the brigade, he would get stronger anyway, but having a rival, he wants to surpass further increases his growth rate, and maybe that will make him go further than he would in other circumstances. That said, the princess says it's not just these two, but everyone in the brigade is excellent, she kept an eye on Ike even before he joined the army. The man is very efficient, and without him, the brigade wouldn't be able to operate properly. Chris had a great importance in this battle, he seems like an idiot, but the girl thinks it's just an act, because when it comes down to it, he has moments of great intelligence. About Nazarena, the princess already knew she was very powerful, but it was still surprising in this battle. Fee was recognized as a half-dragon thaumaturge who hates people, but he takes care of others well and is respected by subordinates. Also, his sister is in the group even though he hides it. And finally, the twins, although they don't show much emotion, chose the brigade as their home and fought to protect it. After all this presentation about her followers, the princess suddenly stops and says that from this point on, Ragna must go on without her because Steria needs to forge a sword now. She wonders if it will come out of the head, the heart, or maybe the soul. She remembers that she has had the image of a sword inside her for a long time, but she can't distinguish the details, she only knows it's a sword called Silver Comet. As she utters these words, we see the image of a comet in the background. The princess continues, saying that a long time ago a silver star flew through the cosmos being the origin of all silver. And creating a sword that carries the name of that comet is the princess's reason for living. She says she will do it, even if it means going to the base, regardless of what happens, she intends to create a sword worthy of Ragna. Suddenly, the ground beneath the guy gives way, and he starts to fall, while the girl says that actually all she wanted was for them to see each other one last time. Then Ragna wakes up in another place, all bandaged up again. In the same place, there are Chris and the team of mages. The guy leaves the place and finds himself in a camp, realizing he was inside a tent with the others. Outside, he hears the voice of Mr. Slime, who is trying to boost the morale of the humans, but in a very offensive way. When Slime realizes Ragna has woken up, he jumps on him happily because the guy is finally standing after sleeping for two days. He says all this while calling Ragna a stupid and idiotic human. At this moment, Ike appears and is also relieved to see that Ragna has awakened. He then invites the guy to meet a certain person. On the way, the Reaper asked about Shin, so Slime replies that the short guy left alone because he couldn't stand the morning atmosphere either. At this point, some civilians appear asking Ike how long they need to stay in the camp. When Ike replies that they will stay a little longer, one of the men says they are running out of food, a woman asks for medicine for her baby who has a fever. The soldier says he will bring the medicine later, but needs to keep moving. The complaints continue, but unfortunately, there's not much he can do at the moment, so he moves on. A little farther away, Ike explains that they managed to teleport 600 civilians and there are several other camps like this one. About 80 brigade members survived, but few of them can move. As long as it continues like this, they won't be able to do everything that needs to be done. Suddenly, Ike realizes that Ragna hasn't eaten anything yet. He apologizes and decides to go back to get some military rations, but Ragna says he's more worried about Ike himself. Although he says it's okay, he reveals that he just wanted something, anything. Because if he stops at this moment, he thinks he won't be able to do anything else. So at least at this moment, he must act on behalf of the princess. With that, Ragna begins to talk about something he felt. But before he can start explaining, a girl appears asking if he's the Reaper. The hunter immediately recognizes the voice and face of Ultimatia and quickly lands a heavy blow that knocks her down instantly. The guy goes crazy but Ike manages to hold him, trying to explain that this is not the winged monarch. Suddenly. Time stops and several other girls with the same appearance appear in front of them. They speak completing each other about how the Reaper is indeed very strong, which confirms the rumor about his battle against the Wind Monarch in the capital ending in a tie. They even consider going back in time a little because of the one who was attacked, but they decide it's not necessary because they still have several of them. The oldest of the girls decides to become the spokesperson instead. They reveal they are all identical, and the spokesperson comments on the Reaper's resentment toward the Dragon Woman who has the same face, but then explains that they are not the winged monarch, but the dragon scourge of the Solarian Church. And just like him, they want to destroy the dragons. At this moment, Ike bends down and pleads for forgiveness for Ragna, who was confused from just waking up, and because it was he himself who wanted to bring the Reaper to this place, he should be the one punished. However, Soleriana doesn't intend to punish the guy. Furthermore, she believes that if what happened in Lys is true, Ragna must also be a miracle of God, since the value of one of them doesn't even come close to his value. 
On the other hand, Ragna starts to remember this detail that they have the same face and magic, but they're not dragons. But despite everything Solariana said, she ends up saying that she will grant Ike's request and punish herself after all, they are all miracles of God too, and the loss of one of them shouldn't go unpunished. After vomiting at the sight of so many women identical to Ultimatia, Ragna asks that instead of taking Ike's life, they use the power of time to bring the other one back. The priestess confirms that she can do that, but it's something that consumes a lot of magical power, and it's not worth it for just one of them. With that, the Reaper then says that if they eliminate Ike, he will end each one of them. Thus, the spokesperson ends up agreeing and revives the companion, who soon realizes that she had died. The current spokesperson confirms what happened and asks if she should return to her position as Karula, then the revived one denies it because she doesn't know what happened while she was dead, so the other one should continue. Seeing this, Ike remembers that some time ago he asked the princess why she didn't want to become a dragon scourge. The answer was simply that she didn't want to become one of them. Now Ike understands that they are all lunatics. After that, they go to another place among the ruins, where Solarian explains that these are the ruins of a city from the ancient civilization, which the Solarian church preserves. This place is protected by several layers of barriers that prevent dragons from approaching. At this moment, it is revealed that the priestess healed Ragna, but she couldn't do much because he has an impressive constitution. The guy is very resistant to magic, and the more he regains strength, the less effective the magic becomes, and thus, Solariana only managed to save him from almost dying, but he still remains severely injured. Staying the way she speaks, Ragna can only remember even more of Ultimatia, and this makes him nauseous again, having to ask the girl to cover her face. She understands that it's an uncomfortable image for him, as he hates the monarch so much. It's at this moment that Nazarene approaches to serve everyone at the table. Ike seems uncomfortable, and when Ragna recognizes the woman, Karula explains that she is also from the Solarian Church. The Scourge explains that outside the territory of the church, people with special abilities are often persecuted, and to avoid this, the church sent agents to various places. In this case, Nazarena's mission was to recruit a potential miracle of God, who would be the Silver Princess of Lees to join the church. Basically, she had to gain the princess's trust as a tutor or as a private assassin, and when there was no more room for her in Lees, Nazarena would be the bridge between the girl and the church, but the woman failed and now awaits her own punishment. Ike asks if the princess knew about this because he always thought the two were good friends. Nazarena responds that it's hard to say what the princess thought, but she thinks that if the girl knew, she wouldn't forgive her. Having said that, she steps away after serving the tea. The Reaper refuses the drink, so only the girl and the slime drink it. Then, calling Ragna master, she invites him to be a dragon scourge. The guy immediately responds no, even though Karula says that his constitution seems very much like a miracle from the god of the sun and it's this kind of people that the church is looking for. While the slime struggles on the ground after burning its tongue with the tea, the priestess mentions that the reaper's deeds in Lys make him perfectly capable of becoming a scourge, and the benefits are very good. As a last attempt, she says they won't be able to receive the refugees from Lys if he doesn't join the church. The girl also explains that the church has been encouraging the princess to become a driving scourge for years, and she is committed to joining the church under the condition of receiving the refugees, but then the worst happened. When she says that if they only had the princess's head, they could have done something, Ragna notices a glint in a distant building. The priestess concludes by saying that since the princess couldn't make it to the church, they can't accept the refugees unless the reaper accepts the proposal. Ragna remembers the state of the people in the camp and asks why she didn't help the teleportation if she's so powerful. So she replies that person's value is determined by their achievements, and the princess was a candidate who should show adequate proof of being a miracle of God but she couldn't, unlike Ragna, who seems to have been chosen by the god of the sun. The guy says he doesn't care about that divinity, so Karula comments that everyone receives blessings from the god even without knowing, two examples being sunlight and silver. Angry, the reaper destroys the table asking why the god doesn't come down to destroy all the dragons. Without a response, Ragna says that the church will receive the refugees and in return, he will end the winged monarch. The girl approves the proposal while returning the tea to the cup. After all this, Ike apologizes for using Ragna as a bargaining chip, but the guy knows that he did what had to be done. Under the excuse of needing to go, Ragna steps away, accompanied only by the slime, but in fact, he goes to the building where he saw that glint, where he finds Crimson. After being completely healed in a laboratory, Ragna recognizes the place and asks if he was fixed, so Crimson explains that the base has self-repair capabilities, otherwise, Ragna would never have been forgiven. Additionally, since he had nothing to do for the past two days, Crimson also advanced the repairs and even reconnected the base to the surface of the moon. In another part of the base, Ragna sees Chimera and greets her, but she says she doesn't know him. 
The Golem also speaks up, saying he's in this place too, but he can't be seen, yet Ragna already states that he doesn't like him. The Slime then tells everyone to be quiet because they're in the presence of Master Crimson, who mentions that he learned the details of the battle and talks about the princess's death. The Redhead says that's bad, but there's nothing they can do, so they should just be grateful that Ragna is still alive. Crimson also mentions that the Battle of Lease is over, and although they didn't win, they gained some benefits, so from now on, they will work to create a combat force centered around Ragna. The next step will be taken within three years when the restoration of the Glow Chamber is complete. For Ragna, the battle is not over because Ultimatia still lives, but Crimson says that at the moment the chances of victory are low, and if Ragna wants to ensure victory, they need to prepare and wait for the right moment. Ragna, as impatient as ever, says he wants to win now. Understanding what's going on, Crimson says that winning earlier won't bring the Silver Princess back. He then mentions that several members of the Silver Brigade survived, and they could fight alongside Ragna one day, which would make the soldiers stronger and everyone would avenge the princess. At this moment, Ragna reveals that the princess is still alive. Crimson finds this impossible, but Ragna explains that at the end of the battle, they connected deeply through their auras and he still feels the connection even on the moon. In the madness of battle, he hadn't understood, but now he finds it strange how things happened. After the attack, Woltikamu put the princess's head back on her neck, and it stayed in place as if it were a magnet, but Ragna doesn't know why Kemi did that. Still, Crimson doesn't think this proves that the woman survived. Ragna then regrets usually letting people monopolize the conversation when they start talking because he should have told the soldiers from the beginning that Steria is still alive. He wants to see her again. Finally, he asks Crimson for help because the battle is not over yet. The mage says he can't act on something so doubtful, and when Ragna says he's sure of what he's saying, the redhead also comments that Ragna can't defeat Wolt to Kamio. The issue is that the enemy has time control magic, Kamui, and preparation on their side. Just to counter the time control, they would need the element of surprise, but they don't have that now. Ragna insists on dealing with Kamui while Crimson would deal with Ultimatia, because being the former monarch, Crimson can surely do something, but the redhead says he would need time to prepare for this something and there's no reason to fight at the moment. However, Ragna thinks the princess is reason enough. She's an amazing person, and they also need her to destroy the dragons. Crimson disagrees because they already have Ragna himself. The combat unit centered on him would be the greatest force of dragon destruction when armed with Silverine on Ragna. Of course, the princess would be a great asset if she were present, but it's not necessary. For Crimson, with Ragna strengthening the troop and him commanding, the princess is not a resource worth risking a battle with so much disadvantage. Finally, he says that Ragnar swore to destroy the dragons with him, not the princess, and the hunter must follow him to survive. Ragnar doesn't quite understand what he means by survive, so the former monarch explains that the hunter is still alive purely by luck. By chance, he ended up being the only survivor in each battle, basically being carried by a miraculous wave of coincidences, but his next action could be when luck runs out. Upon hearing this, Ragna thinks of all those who perished around him while he survived alone, finding it weird that this is luck and not a curse. But that's what makes him decide not to rely on luck anymore. He will make everyone survive because he now understands why he wants to fight. It's not for revenge or fear of losing things, but because he wants everyone to survive and laugh together. Therefore, he decides not to ask Crimson for help anymore. With the hunter determined to go alone, the golem comments that telling the brigade that Steria is still alive will make them return to Lys, where they will fight a battle with no chance of victory, meaning Ragna would be sending them to certain death. Obviously, that's not what Ragna wants. He remembers Shin and the other's willpower, so he says that even if that happens, it wouldn't be his fault. With that, Crimson realizes that he messed up and there's nothing more to do. At Ragna's request, he summons the door that leads to Earth but warns the guy he will regret it. Suddenly, the hunter feels the effect of the poison he took earlier, which would only take effect if he rebelled against Crimson. When the guy falls flat on the floor, the redhead comments that a tool that cannot be used must be broken and reproposed. The golem is amazed by the scene, but Crimson is calm because he only needs Silverine's battle arts, and he can recreate that power in another person using Ragna's body as a research object. Furthermore, he can use the brain to make a zombie. These crazy ideas make the mage laugh, but it's at this moment that Ragna wakes up, the guy is alive, just a little dizzy, so he thinks it was all a bluff by Crimson. However, the former monarch was serious, and now he panics because the gene-destructive nanobots controlled by artificial intelligence have nothing to do with magic, so they should have killed the hunter. Even though he's kind of sword, he should be at least half dead. To calm the mage, Ragna pats him and ends up exerting too much force and throws him away. Then the guy asks why Crimson's words don't motivate him. While Chimera tries to hit the hunter, he talks about a memory from the future when they first met. 
Future Ragnet immediately eliminated Crimson, but found it strange that he didn't have a heart. The hunter asks where the heart is, mentioning that the words and actions of the brigade members keep him motivated and moving forward, surely because everyone risks their own lives, but Crimson is different. He always has a plan for the next time. Anyway, the chances of victory at the moment are low but not zero. So if Crimson can't accept the challenge now, Ragnet asks when he will eradicate the lineage. The redhead makes the Chimera stop attacking and tells Ragnet to follow his path and do whatever he wants, then he self-destructs and moves on with a new body to rest. With this situation, the slime becomes sad and starts to cry. On the ground, the Reaper finds the soldiers that already know that the princess is alive because of Kriz arm that he can only move through the connection with her power, so since he can still move it, they already know the truth and are willing to go rescue Steria. In the meantime, Kamli is indeed with her. The girl asks why she's still alive, so Gi explains that the head obviously reconnects when it's put back right after the cut. Then he shows a mark on her neck and says that if the Reaper or any of his companions get close to her, or if she leaves the capital, she will be based instantly. Anyway, her life has only been prolonged a little but not for long because Ulta Zora is resentful for having lost his comrade. Regarding the battle, the princess discovers that Kami was already at the scene. He says he was just planning to take a look, but ended up getting entertained. At that moment, his arm dissolves into silver and his body begins to crack, so Kami rebuilds the body with a burst of electric power and says that the Reaper left a beautiful scar on him despite having rebuilt his own body several times. That's why the princess is still alive. Walter Kimli wants to fight the Reaper again, but with him in his best form, and he knows that the princess can help the guy overcome his own limits. The girl mentions that she's going to die anyway when Ragna arrives, so Kamui confirms and says that for this reason, she has to make a sword for the Reaper, one that can go head-to-head -head against his claws. Meanwhile, Ultimatia prays, swearing to destroy God's enemies and recover his power, and asks him to speak to her again when this happens. Without announcing himself, Borgias appears in his new humanoid body and asks what God said to her. The monarch comments that she's not used to this new appearance of his. The elder then says that he's still getting used to having his own arms and legs and having a young appearance. Next, the girl asks about the enemies. Borgias replies that Zora has already discovered many teleportation circles around the city. Speaking of Zora, Borgias thinks he'll only regain sanity after avenging Terra Tectra and maybe not even then. We see then that the strategist is really out of it, when he realizes that the sun hasn't risen. Upon receiving the information, Borgias goes directly to Nebulum to warn that the sun disappeared out of nowhere. Nebulum says it's alright he did it. As he's in the place created by the former monarch through the manipulation of time and space, he managed to create an area of eternal night throughout the capital himself. The young man then apologizes for not asking permission for this because he ended up getting carried away. Borgias recognizes that Nebulum has an invaluable talent and praises the young man a lot, saying finally that he can leave him in charge without any problem. He mentions that the former monarch was very cold, unlike Ultimatia who cries for them and shows true feelings, so Nebulum must take care of her for him. Meanwhile, Woltekamu recalls his own story. His mother was electrocuted during childbirth. People tried to capture or get rid of him, so he eliminated everyone. Time passed as he wiped out people and dragons, accumulating power, skill, and weapons until he was complete, but it's not enough, he's fascinated by the Reaper's strength. Eliminating an opponent like that for him must be like surpassing even God's power. Staria is already preparing to forge the most powerful sword in the world. Far away, Ike urges Fu to prepare the portal soon. The Thaumaturge says it will be ready by morning. The soldier takes the opportunity to ask about the circles in the capital. So Fu says he prepared them by order of the princess. It was a contingency plan when the new district was being developed anyway. Only magical power is missing for the teleportation to be ready. Ike then gathers the others and goes to Soleriana, who agrees to help them with the necessary magical power. In return, she asks for the formula of the magic circle and a little blood from Ragna, Fu, and Majorca. Finally, the priestess said that despite half of the winged lineage being exterminated, their main battle forces still remain. With this, Ragna says they will hunt Ultimatia, because if she perishes, the lineage will go with her. In the meantime, Crimson is in bed agonizing over what happened, he's angry at the way Ragna talked about risking their own lives. At that moment, the redhead also learns that Borgias plans to sacrifice himself. With this, he activates a satellite display to observe the capital. Realizing that the enemies seem to be acting hastily, the mage already gathers the servants and orders them to prepare for battle, because he realizes he can use Ragna's attack as bait for them to catch Ultimatia. With the brigade gathered, Ike worries about asking if everyone's well rested, and they throw the question back at him because he's the one who was sleepless. But thankfully, Chris knocked the leader out to rest with a good beating, so everything's fine. Now, onto the mission, he mentions the information Nazarena brought after stopping by the capital about five hours ago. The situation is terrible. 
Not a single citizen survived, and there's a giant tree absorbing nutrients from them. The new district and the old district are in ruins, but on the other hand, a palace district is strangely intact. Furthermore, Nazarena herself comments that she felt an increase in silverine in an area of the palace district. To her, it was the light of incorporated restrictions, so she believes the princess is in that place. Upon hearing this, the brigade starts to celebrate. Ike then comments that the monarch must be there too, so the mission is to rescue the princess and eliminate the monarch. At this moment, he recalls Nazarena's reports that the enemy probably already discovered the teleportation circles because they have a very efficient surveillance network, but still, she managed to infiltrate. The question is, if the enemy has such capabilities to maintain such an efficient surveillance network, how would they have lost sight of a circle that was already there through which she infiltrated? This leads everyone to conclude it's a trap. He doesn't even need to tell the others, but they need to fight, as there's nowhere else to go. Despite having four superior dragons left, Solariana says that just by eliminating the monarch, who is the heart of the lineage, the rest will fall together. That's what's in the scripture. Ragna, hidden in a corner, says he doesn't care about such scripture. But he confirms it's right, and that he'll deal with Wolt Kamui, while the others hunt the monarch. Shin questions why the guy is hiding in that corner, and Ragna responds that he doesn't like being the center of attention. The short guy then starts teasing him about everything that happened on the battlefield. Meanwhile, Ike discusses strategies with Solariana. Regarding time control magic, Karula says that power isn't exclusive to the monarch. As for civilians, the church will be responsible for them. At this moment, Chris tells Hizala she should stay because she doesn't seem to be in a condition to fight. However, she says that after losing her sister, she doesn't even know what she should be feeling, so she's going to fight. Ike tells everyone to get ready to leave in two hours, when the sun will be rising in the capital. The swordsman Garm takes the opportunity to talk to Ragna. The old man asks if his body has already healed because even Ike mentioned that the Reaper went to take a dump and somehow came back completely recovered. To cover it up, Ragna confirms that it was indeed what left him renewed. Without questioning, Garm challenges him to a duel just to practice. While the old man has the sword in hand, Ragna uses his own hand as a weapon. They exchange two blows quickly, and in an instant, the boy overpowers the swordsman. They exchange compliments, saying they've both gotten stronger since last time. However, the old man mentions that it actually seems like Ragna is just getting used to strength he already has. Impressed, the boy shares excitement that the swordsman noticed that. He reveals that all this strength isn't exactly his. He just received it without working hard, and yet people treat him as someone amazing, but it feels wrong to him. It's hard for him to be proud of his power. Putting that conversation aside, the old man asks about Mr. Slime and Ragna says he must still be pooping. Garmin talks about the Terratector's attack, where Ragna made Slime protect him in Shin, but he dodged to go after the Reaper and ended up seeing him cut through the explosion, which wasn't just magic, it was heat, impact, and even sound. The old man comments that Ragna could have gone straight past, but chose to stay and face the attack, protecting those behind him. Seeing that Garm decided to imitate, it wasn't against such a powerful attack, but it was quite complicated, and he managed to do it. With that, he finishes by asking Ragna that even if he feels alone and isn't proud of himself, he should continue leading them and showing his strength because it will make many people overcome their own limits, and maybe some can reach his level. Obviously, Garm intends to be the first person to achieve this. Ragna thinks alone about a future where many people become as strong as him. That future would be great. The time comes for everyone to leave. Majorica was drugged so she wouldn't wake up and want to go along with the teleportation. Of the mages, only few will participate. The others are worried and sad, wanting him to join the church with them. But he wishes only to serve the princess. He walks up to the circle and activates the magic. The red light shines on the floor drawings. Meanwhile, the Solarians use another magic that brings a golden glow to circulate all the soldiers. This is the measure against the time-stopping magic. Karula explains that this will give them three minutes of stop time, but Ragna is exempt because it wouldn't affect him. As she speaks, her appearance begins to age. She explains that this is what happens when using this power in a human form, but as the goal of the Solarian Church is to help those fighting against the dragons as much as possible, they give their lives willingly. When the brigade arrives in the capital, the mark on the princess's neck is indeed activated, and Camus already realizes the enemy has arrived. They fall through a golden glow in the sky, and Ike already notices that the sun isn't rising. Near the tree, Borgius starts an attack using giant serpents, but is stopped by Zora who wants to imitate Terra Tectra and protect the progenitor to the last breath, so he wants to deal with the enemies alone first. As he speaks, Ragna hits him with three swords, but doesn't cause much damage. When Multikemi reveals himself, Ragna goes straight for him. 
As he heals from the three silver wounds, Ulta Zora tells Borgias to prepare for the trash that will take advantage of this opening. Nebulum feels like something is approaching, but doesn't know from where, maybe from above. And really that's when Crimson realizes that time hasn't stopped yet, and knowing that the best use of this ability would be to freeze time as soon as the enemy appears, Crimson concludes that they can't use that power right now. So it's time for action. The redhead sends a Megazord plummeting through a spatial connection at high speed. Nebulum is impressed to see the portal, and not only that, he sees that it's not a living creature. Following the strategist's advice, Borgias uses the serpents to attack the mecha with rays fired from their mouths. Ragna notices that Crimson has appeared as he had expected. The armor passes unscathed through the attacks, and after reaching the ground, begins to hit the snakes with freezing silver shots. Chamorai is also on the battlefield now. Borgias starts to fly and puts more snakes into action. But this time raising the tree and joining them to form a giant dragon from the trunk and roots, Kaki. He says he doesn't intend to interfere in the fight, but now that he's gigantic, he won't be responsible if he accidentally steps on someone. Walter Kamui and Ragna stare at each other until the Reaper notices Starlia's body on the ground. Anxiously, he runs to her and Kamui steps back a bit to let the opponent say goodbye. Nearly at his base, the girl recognizes Ragna when he holds her in his arms. At that moment, Ulta Zora warns that the princess will die soon, and even if he is eliminated, they can't stop the effect of the poison. He's doing all of this to vent his anger. Then he appears behind Ike and defends himself from three attacks at once. After saying he'll make them suffer the same agony he's feeling, Zora sends the three opponents flying away while transforming. As for Ragna, he wonders what to do for someone who's dying. The princess calls him by name as he tries to imagine the possibilities of how he could help her, perhaps the church or crimson, but there's no time for anything. The girl then tells him to pick up a sword lying on the ground. Just by seeing the object, the Reaper remembers the story the princess told about the silver comet that crossed the cosmos long ago, the origin of all silver. So he recognizes that this is the silver comet sword. The girl then apologizes, saying that Ragna fulfilled his promise, but this was the best sword she could make, which is a failure because it's not enough to stand up against Kamui's demonic sword. Coughing heavily and with tears in her eyes, the girl still says that next time she will forge a sword worthy of being used by Ragna, but there won't be a next time for her. The Reaper is apprehensive because he wants both of them to survive and laugh together. But if that can't happen, he doesn't know what to do for her before she passes away. At that moment, he remembers what Garm said about continuing to show his strength to others. Determined, he tells her to pay attention and tells her that he felt her constantly before arriving, and he feels her even more deeply with the sword in hand. Thus, he says that this is a good sword, and he will win using it against the demonic sword to hunt Wol to Kamu. Even if Starlia can't see him, he will shine so brightly that she will see him as clear as day. When Nazarena approaches to hold the princess, he backs away, thinking that if she dies, he will mourn, but he will also be happy to have known her. So now he just wants her to watch until the end. The hunter then takes off his coat and ties it around his waist, determined to become stronger in the future Ragna. Soon Kamui descends to face Ragna, realizing that the farewell is over. The Reaper tells him to hurry up and turn into a dragon, while Wolt Kamui says he wants to continue from where they left off last time. Like a good villain, he takes the opportunity to give us some information, saying that this claw he uses changes its own characteristics to suit the user, so it only became the lightning claw when he grabbed it. Its power is expansion and transformation at lightning speed. As he says this, he's already transformed into a demonic form and the sword is becoming gigantic. The power generates electrical discharges around Kamui and destroys much of the ground. The Reaper doesn't care about all this talk and showing off from his opponent. Finally, he prepares an attack with the demonic sword and fires it, saying he's attacking with everything, however, the hunter holds the attack with one hand, instantly freezing Kemui's power up to his arm. Then he advances quickly and hits the opponent, leaving him without an arm and a leg. Even so, Wolt Kemui continues to smile. As promised, Ragna now begins to shine brightly, illuminating the princess. As the Reaper tells the enemy again to transform into a dragon quickly so he can defeat him in his most powerful form, the Silver Comet transforms as well and shines even brighter. As he regenerates electrically, Kamui laughs like a madman and compares the weapons. While the Lightning Claw is a sword that reaches 100% in the user's hands, Ragna's sword elevates the user to 120%. Taking back the weapon, he finally goes into his final form, transforming into a dragon. Ragna now observes seriously, and the two stare at each other for a while, with the silver-slash-blue glow of the Silver Comet and Ragna contrasting with the golden glow of Kemui's lightning and the lightning claw. The snake heads begin firing energy blasts from their mouths, but they can't hit either the Chimera or the armor, and end up getting hit by silver shots, while some missiles hit the transformed Borgias. Still, the dragon keeps attacking with energy rays. 
Chimera then starts complaining because despite dodging all attacks, the mecha isn't causing much damage to the enemy, but that's because its main weapon can't be used in this space. Meanwhile, Woltakamui and Ragna use their powers against each other, causing great destruction to the surrounding terrain with the impact of their energies. Mazarina dodges the debris carrying the princess in her arms. Seeing this, the Reaper sends one of his swords in their direction, helping Mazarina gain more speed, and also destroying part of the debris. The power struggle continues until the hunter leaps and reaches Kaomi's face to land a powerful Silverine attack. The dragon is thrown away but stops in mid-air and heads back towards its opponent. They wrestle for a brief moment, then Kamui hits Ragna with its tail, and as the guy falls, the dragon advances downward, nearly hitting him with its blade. Then they exchange a few more blows, still, in a balanced fight. Nearby, the Chimera admits that, like the male counterpart, she also wouldn't be able to inflict much damage on this giant dragon. Due to a careless move, the armor ends up colliding with Wolta to Kamui, and loses one of its arms before falling to the ground. When the giant Borgis prepares a powerful energy attack, Ragna uses a silverine attack that freezes the red ray and pierces the enemy's head, freezing even a part of its neck. However, the Reaper is hit and thrown away, exiting the dome. When the robot realizes the Borgius' situation, it tries to take advantage to attack the vulnerable enemy. However, two more dragon heads sprout from the giant body, while the frozen one falls off. The giant dragon shows no mercy to the enemy and immediately launches a double attack. Meanwhile, the brigade soldiers advance towards Ulto Zora, who was also transformed and launch a spike attack at the approaching enemies. To protect themselves, the humans lift a very large rock from the ground, using it as a shield. Seizing the moment, Old Garm appears from behind and lands some blows on the dragon, creating an opening for Shin to attack and freeze Ulto Zora's tail just before being knocked down by a stone. The superior dragon now feels a bit apprehensive that perhaps is being surpassed, realizing that even after losing the Silver Princess, the humans seem to have become even stronger, especially the Elder, who at this moment jumps among the debris and continues attacking the enemy. The dragon starts to take flight, but Hezela uses her sonic attack, and once again, the swordsman hits it, destroying one of its wings. Ulta Zora, despite being surpassed, remains confident because it has been releasing an odorless and tasteless toxin since the beginning of the battle. So without the princess's protection, the troops will soon succumb. However, it's at this moment that it realizes Fu absorbing all the toxin through his arm. The superior dragon then projects an attack to stop him, but Garm appears, propelling the blast and cutting off one of its arms. With the beast down, the humans remain focused and go after it until Chris's metal arm falls to the ground, indicating that the princess is already at her limit. Ulto Zora mentally invokes Terra Tectra and asks how his comrade could fight so fiercely, as he would like to be more like the former companion in his final moments. The dragon then starts to change shape again and becomes even bigger. With an attack on the ground, it sends several humans flying away with just the shockwave. Worse still, Garm was directly hit, being cut in half. Meanwhile, the battle between Ragna and Kamui continues fiercely. The dragon once again knocks the Reaper to the ground, but this time it pins the guy with its blade and prepares a powerful energy shot. The hunter frees himself in time to hold off the attack with one hand and counterattack with the other in the shape of a sword, dissipating the blast and nearly hitting the opponent, who holds the blade between his hands. Still, the guy keeps pushing the enemy upwards with his power until they reach the stratosphere. They stare at each other and resume attacking. From the ground, Nazarena sees the opponent's lights clashing in the sky and comments to the princess that it's a very beautiful sight. At that moment, Starlia says that the tutor shouldn't be wasting time with someone who is about to die and should just leave her. Seeing the girl in this state, the woman has a flashback to when the princess was a child and she introduced herself for the first time as her tutor. The girl was dismantling a bear with her telekinesis and seemed like a wild animal with many broken things in the room, and upon noticing the woman in the room, she began firing several wooden pieces at her, but Nazarena shows her incredible agility by stopping all the attacks with her hand. Then the woman begins to speak about royalty being a bloodline guaranteed by sovereignty through divine right, meaning the royal lineage is exalted flawlessly, and it's impossible for someone of royal blood to be born with physical defects, logically thinking. Normally, the girl would have been considered stillborn, but what saved her was the hope brought by her peculiar abilities. Suddenly, Starlia starts growling, so the woman tells her to stop acting like a wild beast that doesn't understand what she says because Nazarena knows she's intelligent, she can manipulate the auras emitted by creation, and if she wanted, she could tear a person in half with a simple thought, but she understands that one shouldn't do that because it would ruin the chances of being accepted by others. Nazarena says that's a smart decision, and it's at this moment that the girl speaks for the first time to the woman saying she doesn't want to be accepted, but revered. With that said, the tutor begins to impart her vision of how she should behave to show her worth, starting with etiquette. 
In the present, Nazarena bids farewell to the princess as she walks away. Meanwhile, Nebulum starts to feel Crimson's intrusion. The dragon knows the mage is going to try to take control of the alternate space where the progenitor is now. We then see Crimson casting a spell while preparing a jutsu with his hands, all of this to infiltrate the computer system as if he were a magical hacker. Nebulum begins to despair because he has nothing he can do to stop the intruder. He then remembers the last encounter with the Elder and clings to the thought that Ultimatia is counting on him. The problem is, whenever Nebulum achieves any result, Mr. Smile swallows him. Crimson arrives in the dimension where the monarch is and points a gun at her. The progenitor only realizes something is wrong when she hears Nebulum scream from the other side trying to warn her. Crimson fires a shot while the slime continues the feeding process. Fortunately for the dragon, the projectile only hits her shoulder, so she retaliates against the enemy with fire, but Crimson manages to escape and aims back at her. Ultimatia recognizes the enemy as he makes modifications to the dimension's control, using spatial manipulation to set the existence condition of this dimension to must have the status of the winged monarch, and time manipulation to set the passage of time at one third of the speed of time outside, ensuring no interruptions. Even if the monarch recovers her magic, it won't affect anything outside of this dimension. When Ultimatia realizes that the wound isn't healing, she recalls Kemui's advice, and instead of being afraid, she gets angry and prepares for battle. In a flashback, Crimson remembers when he prepared to put his heart back. An image of his monarch version suddenly appears and questions this decision, reminding him of the self-imposed rule that he must discuss the matter with an objective version of himself when making any important decision. Other versions appear to question the situation, but Crimson is convinced that he needs to act now to make his previous moves worthwhile. The girl version asks if it's worth doing this for that mediocre man, referring to Ragna, but for Crimson, that had already been decided. The issue is that with his heart back, he won't be able to recover even 10% of his power, so it's smarter to leave the heart and fight as an immortal. However, he thinks that with such a limited existence, he wouldn't be able to eliminate someone with such a monumental existence as a monarch dragon. On the other hand, even restoring such a small percentage of his power, he is sure he could defeat the newcomer. Back in the present, we see Crimson and Ultimatia fighting transformed. Crimson dodges some attacks, prepares solar grenades while the monarch retreats into an energy shield and fires a shot that apparently doesn't have much effect, but it turns out that this ammunition was created by Crimson to self-destruct, disrupting the blood flow and rendering the magic useless. Since both use time control magic, the blood flow is similar, which is why it also works on the monarch. Since there were 12 bullets in the magazine and two were used, now there are 10 left. Crimson knows that if at least one hits Ultimatia's heart, victory will be guaranteed. The mage then speeds up the shots but only attacks when some grenades distract the opponent. However, he doesn't hit the heart, only a wing. At least that's enough to knock the progenitor off the platform. Crimson then follows her in the fall, determined to adjust his aim for the next attack. However, as he prepares for another shot, Ultimatia, desperate, creates a giant luminous sphere. Outside, the sun is finally rising, but Ultazora doesn't seem weakened. He attacks fiercely and throws Chris away against a building. He then attacks the other soldiers, ending several of them in sequence. Ike decides to retreat, but the dragon goes after him this time, but Lee is defended by Fu, who then injects an option into his own neck, changing the color of his hair and eyes and releasing a large amount of power. He then tells Ike to do what he needs to do if he doesn't regain consciousness. Transformed with the dragon arm released, the guy starts to remember the princess telling him to study the practical uses of teleportation circles. This knowledge should be used when the princess is about to strike, and she explains that she's sharing this with him because it's her way of showing that she has no intention of letting him go. In the present, Fu lands a hit on Ulto Zora and then lands several other blows frantically, but is hit on the side afterward. However, the Thaumaturge doesn't seem phased. He bites the enemy with the mouth of his arm and activates magic absorption while using this power to keep pushing the superior dragon. They hit a building and destroy part of the construction while Ike just watches from afar. From the confrontation, the guy ends up seeing the top part of Fu's body flying away, so Ike decides to run after him. The problem is, the guy is falling into the abyss. In another part of the battlefield, Shin regains consciousness, realizing he's lost an arm and a leg. He gets angry because he's supposed to be the most talented person in the brigade. That's what everyone says, so if he's weak, it means everyone in the Silver Brigade is just a bunch of weaklings too. He says this with tears in his eyes, and as he grabs his sword and activates his power again, the short guy says he doesn't need a future anymore. He's covered in blue aura, and soon stands up with a more determined look. In the sky, you can still see the lights of Ragna facing Kamui. Shin then says that even if it's just for this moment, he's going to reach great heights because it's time to fly. Next week, we'll have more of this anime as soon as the new episode is released. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel.
And don't forget to hit the like button below to support this video. See you guys.